All right. A very good afternoon to you all. And I'm privileged to, to welcome you all to today's or the final day of the Ghana Gas Virtual Internship and Field Trip for Students and Young Professionals brought to you by the Ghana National Gas Company and then the Society of Petroleum Engineers, Ghana Section. On day one of the virtual internship and field trip, we had the overview of the gas sector. And then again, we had the gas demand and supply balance. On day two and three, we're privileged to be handled by Mr. Albert Mr. Tando and then engineer Kwapenam Reku Michael, who took us through the entire processes of the gas plants in Atuabo. On today and then the final day, we are also privileged to be joined by two distinguished personalities who will be taking us through the health and safety measures and then the gas tariffs and NGO pricing. Once again, I would like to thank you all very much for joining us. I would like to thank you all very much for joining us and on, on behalf of the section officers and then the board of directors and welcome you all to today's uh, today and then the final day of, of, of our virtual internship. Without much I do, I'll, I'll hand over the, 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 the platform to Mr. Jasu Yahaya, who is the HSC manager for Ghana National Gas Company. to run us through the health and safety aspects of their operations. Mr. Yaya, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Please, am I audible? Very, very audible. OK. Right. So the company is Ghana National Gas Company, Ghana Gas for short. Right, right. So as you rightly said, um, I was told to speak to you about safety in the industry. Just a brief uh, introduction about myself. My name is Jasu Yaya. I'm the manager in charge of health, safety, and environment at Ghana Gas. I'm a member of the Institute of Directors Ghana. Um, just a minute. Yes, just make your your presentation uh, in the in the in the presentation format. Okay. Uh, can you see the presentation? Hello. Yeah. Hello. I can hear you. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. But it is we are we are seeing the other slide. So I wanted you to just just uh, press so on. I'm in presentation mode now. Is it is it showing presentation mode? Okay, you don't know, just go on. It's fine. It's gone. Is it showing? No, it's not showing on the presentation mode. I don't know why. Then let me stop sharing and share again. Okay, all right, that's fine. You know, we tried it and it worked, so I don't know why. Okay. Am I in presentation mode or not? Yes, please. Just go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. Okay. All right, thank you. So as I said, uh, I'm a member of the Institution of Directors Ghana. I'm also a certified member of the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health uh, UK. I'm a member for ISO 45001. It is uh, the international standard for health and safety management systems. I have various uh, professional qualifications. Uh, I have a master's in safety and risk management and also an MBA in corporate governance. Uh, in terms of work experience, I have a total combined experience for the gas industry, 14 years of experience. Before Ghana Gas, I used to work at West African Gas Pipeline. Um, I'm privileged to say that uh, I have experience in the gas sector cutting across from construction to commissioning and operation and maintenance. So I will try to share some of my 
uh, experiences along the presentation. Um, this presentation um, is structured in five sessions. I understand that I have one hour. Um, James, can you confirm? Hello, James. Yes, I think you have 40 minutes for your presentation and then we'll take 20 minutes Q&A. Very good. In the uh, preparation, I was told is not, is about one hour, 30 minutes. So the slides quite detailed. So because of presentation time, I will try to move quite quick. Um, okay, all right. And I think your strategy is that questions will be asked at the end of the presentation, right? So I will try to exactly yeah move yeah. a little fast, and then if anyone notice something, they need to ask questions. They can note it when I finish. Uh, we can go back to whatever section it is. Um, initially I thought is it would be interactive, so I embedded in the presentation some areas where I will engage with the audience. But I can see the setup is such that I have to finish before, so I will skip those kind of uh, sections. But the presentation itself will cover five key areas. One is on the hazards and risk in oil and gas. At least because I'm asked to speak about safety management, we need to understand some of the key hazards and risk in oil and gas. We'll look briefly at the safety management system, the key elements and principles. Uh, we'll look at some few case studies in failures uh, in some key elements of the safety management system. And then we will look at what we call the safe systems of work. And then uh, we will end with emergency response plan. <clears throat> I know that um, I think uh, I spoke to Rivison about the audience and I'm told that you are all engineers. So I think you understand the technical language, but if anybody wants explanation or any concept, you can ask at the end. So um, first of all, what is uh, risk? Uh, the concept of risk in general terms, according to the International Organization for Standardization, um, risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Um, risk is not physical, it's just a concept. It is used to help in providing comparative detail across a range of threats. So those threats that make your uh, objectives uncertain, uh, it's, you express it in risk terms. In terms of health and safety, what is health and safety risk? Um, it is the combination of the likelihood of an occurrence of a hazardous event and the severity of injury or ill health. There are other consequences for uh, risk in health and safety beyond injury and ill health, which includes um, things like property damage and uh, also reputational damage. Uh, words such as hazard and risk are normally used interchangeably uh, by different people, but they are not the same. So let's keep that in mind. Um, risk also, in the concept of risk, there's a perception part of the risk, which is that um, industries such as the nuclear energy, oil and gas, and petrochemical in production tend to be described as high risk. And I'm sure a lot of you have the same perception. Um, uh, but the truth of the matter is that uh, even though these industries are described as high risk, they are probably uh, some of the safest, best managed industries in the world when you look at the incident statuses. So with this mindset, uh, the reason for this is that most organizations usually, the characterization of risk is um, more binary. It's just a binary framework view. So it's either high or low. That's not it really. There are risks that could fall in between the range. Uh, usually also the perception is formed more about 
the threat or hazard and not necessarily the risk itself. So that makes uh, some industries perceived to be more high risk. Let me express this in simple terms. The reason why I'm saying this is that when you look at oil and gas perception, you will say high risk, but I can tell you the number of people who get injured and get killed through, um, let's say, retail trading, those market women and men who deal in retail, moving up and down in the markets, they probably have more in uh, fatalities and injuries than oil and gas. And I think you will agree with that. Um, in terms of the oil and gas industry, risk can be looked at in two different ways uh, because we fall into what we call the process industries where we, we actually operate and maintain facilities that are more complex than the everyday work that people are used to. So because of that, risk in oil and gas can be viewed in either personal safety terms or process safety related risk. When we talk about the personal safety terms, we are talking about a worker occupational health and safety risk. Uh, for example, uh, if somebody is to conduct work at height and the, in the process of working at height, they fall from height and get injured. This is a personal safety risk in oil and gas or driving a forklift uh, and hitting somebody on the way, a pedestrian. This is also personal safety risk. But when you have a failure of a vessel or containment, let's say a straight tank for LPG ruptures, this is what we call the process safety risk issues. And you can see these two issues are not the same. And this is why the, the it's important to look at this. Hello, Mr. Yaya. Hello. It seems your slides are not moving. That's strange. Yeah, it just stuck on the on the very first first slide. Um, um, exactly. Is... It's moving now. I'm actually on this one. Yes. I don't... Right. So let me do this. Exactly. This yeah. is perfect. This is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not actually presenting. I just uh, try to minimize the pain so that you can see. So um, I think I spoke about the uh, risk, uh, general concept. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the slide. Um, now let's look at, I told you about the industry, why people perceive the oil and gas to be high risk is because of some notable incidents in the industry. Globally, uh, in terms of safety incidents, the number of incidents that come to mind, and a lot of these incidents repeat in terms of the causal factors. Um, you will notice that most of these in incidents either result in multiple fatalities or very, very serious property damage and also environmental impact. So because of this, um, the, the, the risk is perceived to be high. And in this case, it is because we deal with what we call materials and operations that have the potential for major accident hazards. So you have to take this at the back of your mind when you are talking about oil and gas. But in terms of really managing the risk, uh, as I said, uh, you actually can see that if you are objective in looking at real data, you will notice that these industries are probably uh, the safest. Um, this is done through their safety management systems. Some examples of some of the notable incidents that we can recall. I'm sure some of you through your education and work have come across the Piper Alpha incident 
that happened in the UK, NOPSI, years, several years ago in 1980. This is one of the case studies you usually use because uh, the extent of fatalities and damage is re remarkable. Uh, then also the BP Texas City ex uh, refinery explosion, which happened on the 23rd of March 2005. We'll look at this one in one of the case studies later. Uh, there's another notable incident in the UK, which was about storage tanks. Uh, they were into tanks, the bouncing field oil storage depot. And the incident happened in 2005. Um, also quite remarkable because it caused a lot of environmental impact. Uh, in our own backyard, I'm sure you all recall the atomic junction uh, gas explosion on the 7th of October, 2017. These are all incidents that remind us of the risk in oil and gas. Um, because we spoke about risk and I told you about hazards and risk, it is important that we look at some of the things that make uh, this industry have a lot of hazards. So the, the properties of the the materials and substances handled and the processes that are operated present a lot of hazards and major accident hazards indeed. That's one of the main issues in oil and gas. So let's look at a few of the properties that present challenge in terms of safety in operations of this uh, material. The first is in terms of our industry, oil and gas, hydrocarbon, we produce a lot of highly flammable gases. And because of the flammability limits, they can form explosive mixtures in air when they are not properly contained. Uh, for example, we process gas and we have one of our products, the dry gas that is used for power generation. This gas, uh, is predominantly made of methane. The higher percentage is of methane. This methane uh, can be explosive in air if the concentration is between 5% to 15% um, in normal uh, volume in terms of concentration in air. When we talk about flammability, we are talking about also explosive limits. The two are quite uh, similar, the two terminologies. That means that at that concentration, we have what we call the lower level, which is in terms of, for example, methane, the 5%, and the higher uh, flammability limit, which is 15 for methane. What it means is that if you have this methane in mixture with air um, at 5%, between 5% to 15%, it will, it is capable of uh, sustaining combustion. Uh, what it means as a science person is that this range is the only range within which this uh, can bend. Below the 5%, usually, it will be too lean to bend because when you look at the fire triangle, you talk about the fuel, the ignition, and the oxygen concentration. So when you have less of the fuel below the 5%, for example, of methane, then you cannot have the ignition or combustion sustained. Then above 15%, it means the fuel now becomes too rich uh, because you need the oxygen and the fuel in the right proportion to bend. When you have too much of the fuel, it means you don't have enough of the oxygen. This means that you will not have uh, combustion as well. This concept is what is used in oil and gas operations for testing for gases. Uh, oil and gas, before you can die any operations uh, that are non-routine in the plant, you will usually have one of the safety measures being that you need to check for flammable gases. So you must understand the gas you are looking for 
and the flammability or explosivity rate range and then you can test for that gas and make sure that the place is safe. Some of the products or material are highly or extremely flammable. Um, also, we have volatile liquids that have very, very low flash points. So for the liquid hydrocarbons, the flash point is a character that in terms of safety is a hazard because at that temperature, the liquid or hydrocarbon liquid, uh, when you are told the flash point of that liquid, it means at that temperature, that liquid is capable of generating vapors that are flammable. So you have to keep in mind the flash point of such a product. So for example, uh, some of them are very low, uh, less than 21 uh, degrees Celsius, such as one of our products, uh, Condense. We produce one of our products called Condense. I'm sure in a patient session, they explained that to you. Um, that means we need to uh, be aware of this. Uh, in our region, the ambient temperature is even higher than the 21 percent. That means that automatically, if you expose this this product to ambient conditions, it's going to generate flammable vapors. Uh, also, another significant character is the vapor pressure. Some of the liquid products, or some of the products, uh, I would say not liquid per se, but some of the products, they must be kept under certain conditions and they exist both in the liquid and vapor or gaseous phases. When the liquid and the vapor are in equilibrium, the vapor is, is seen to exert some amount of pressure on the liquid. So this is what is called the vapor pressure. Now, this is what determines the storage condition, meaning that uh, you have to keep this uh, liquid in the way that the pressure you are storing it is in a way that will keep the liquid and the gaseous phases in equilibrium. For one of our products like LPG, this is a concern. It's a safety hazard that must be aware of, uh, aware of in terms of the storage conditions. Uh, so it's very important to understand the product. Then the vapor density is another character that must be taken into consideration. What does the vapor density mean? When you have the vapor released, it's either going to float in air rising or uh, fall to the ground level. So if the vapor density is greater than one, it means that when you release this vapor, the vapor is likely to settle below uh, at the ground level rather than rise. What's a risk here? It means it can be swept along the uh, working levels to find ignition sources nearby. So this is very important feature to take into consideration. Uh, some of the products too, even though they are engaged is they are quite dangerous in terms of when they are released in an environment where human beings are in the same area. They present what we call asphyxiation risk, whereby they will displace the normal oxygen in that area. And so if you are somebody, a worker working in that area, you will be exposed to this and you will not have uh, enough oxygen that can cause uh, some fatalities as well. And then um, because of the operating conditions of some of the units, they will operate at very, very low temperatures. I'm sure Albert and Michael explained to you some of the process units, especially where the geotonsin effect takes place. Those temperatures are quite cryogenic. Uh, the risk here is that if you are exposed to it, Physically, um, you may have some what we call frostbite. In terms of process safety, 
this equipment as well, their maintenance, care must be taken so that you don't uh, subject it to what we call thermal shock when you stop operation and you want to maintain it. Warming it up must be gradual so that the metal will not suffer uh, thermal shock. And um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, this will be able because uh, we are not able to participate. But we looked at the hazard and risk, and uh, I explained the risk concept in terms of health and safety, which is the combination of the likelihood of an occurrence of a hazardous event, the severity of the injury or ill health. When you say hazard, you are looking at the source, let's say the product, uh, a situation which may be an operational activity or an act by an individual with the potential for harm in terms of human injury or ill health. So keep that in your mind. And we want to look at basic steps in risk assessment. How will you do basic risk assessment? I think this will be important for you. So at least you have basic knowledge now that we are talk talking about hazards and risks. When you want to do any risk assessment, first of all, you need to determine the activity or the work location or the operation where you want to assess. And the first thing you do is identify the hazards. So when I was talking about the some of the hazards of gases and liquids, you will identify whether, for example, there's a flammable gas, likelihood of flammable gas being encountered in this area, or a gas that is likely to cause acidization risk if it is a confined space. Is it possible that that gas has displaced all the oxygen in that space? And so if somebody enters it without a breathing apparatus, they will suffocate to death. So you will do that first. Then you assess in terms of identifying who or persons who might be harmed. So for the specific activity, you will have to determine, is it the worker or any other person in the workspace or even visitors could be exposed to this hazard or even the general public could be impacted. Then you evaluate the risk and decide on the precautions or control measures or the risk controls that you need to take. In evaluating the risk, usually we use what we call a risk metrics because you need to give a very objective estimation of the likelihood and the severity. I'm sure some of you have come across the risk metrics in your education or work uh, experience. So usually the metrics will have one axis being the severity and the other axis being the likelihood. So this will normally, uh, for example, in our case, we use what we call a five by five metrics. So the likelihood is arranged one to five, one being the lowest severity and five being the highest severity, and then the probability also one to five, one being the lowest probability of occurrence, and the five being the highest probability of occurrence. Once you do this, you will combine these two estimations, both the severity and the likelihood. And when you combine them, the resulting or the product you get is a risk of that, uh, what you are assessing. When you do this, you determine the control measures. In determining control measures, there's a principle you need to apply. Safety, we call it the hierarchy of control. So when you are deciding what measures you need to take, the principle is that if you can eliminate the hazard, you have to eliminate it. If you cannot, you go to the next level, what we call substitution. Maybe you cannot eliminate because the operation must go on and that hazard is inherent. 
So if you cannot eliminate, is it possible you will substitute? In substitution, you could change the method or you could change the substance from a more hazardous substance to a less hazardous. For example, if it's about dealing with a chemical. Then if you cannot substitute, you move to the next level, what we call engineering control. Engineering control meaning that you find a physical control measure that will separate the hazard from the person. For example, if you are dealing with a machine or a machine part that is rotating, putting a guard around it is an engineering control. If you cannot do engineering control, you move to the next level, which is the what we call administrative. Administrative controls could include warning signs for people, uh, administrative procedures for executing the task, and maybe reducing the exposure time of the personnel. Then the last, if you cannot do any, is providing personal protective equipment. So for example, if someone has to enter a tank, um, it's likely you can do your ventilation, but this is still not enough. So you may ask the person to wear a briefing apparatus. Some cases, the personal protective equipment, even though it's the lowest in the hierarchy, you cannot about it, you still have to provide it. So this is the basic steps in determining the control, which is the hierarchy. After this, you record this, and then you can implement the measures you have determined. And from time to time, you need to review this. So let's look at some common hazards. Um, you can see my picture. Uh, James, can you confirm? You can see Yes, the please. Picture. Yes, okay. very, very visible. Good. So we spoke about some of the uh, characteristics of uh, the gases and lipids. In this process unit, you can see um, there's a leak here. So if this is a gas that is flammable, it means that it's likely to find an ignition source and there will be fire or fire and explosion. In this unit, it means that control measures must be put in place uh, to prevent leaks in the gas or oil and gas plant because when you lose containment of the hydrocarbon, either gas or liquid, it is very difficult to control it outside its primary containment. So you can see when you have a flammable gas leaking, at that point, and you have less to do um, other than emergency response procedures because uh, if he finds an ignition source, uh, there's not going to be any hesitation. There will be fire. Now, let's look at some additional hazards uh, in the oil and gas, especially our operations. You can see these spherical tanks, these are LPG tanks. These are the LPG storage tanks. And this one, the cylindrical ones are the condensate tanks. So we spoke about LPG. We said that it's stored under pressure. So what are some of the hazards with this product? We mentioned about the vapor pressure. Now, but what is more serious about this product is that in case of any breach of the containment, let's say there's a physical damage to the tank or due to corrosion and loss of metal, there's a hole on the tank. Because this product is stored under pressure, you're going to have the product released under pressure in this case through that opening. Now, with LPG, one of the dangers of this product is what we call 
the boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, which is common with the LPG. In case of fire around it, because it's stored under pressure, if the fire hits the tank shell, it's going to increase the pressure within the tank. And this might exceed the capacity or the strength of the metal or the welding joint. If there will be a failure, this can be catastrophic. The one of the other properties about this product that causes the explosion in terms of belief is that when there's a release through this damage, because it's stored under pressure and it exists in vapor and liquid phase, when you expose it to atmospheric condition, it suddenly converts to gaseous phase. The liquid phase itself becomes gaseous. This is the one of it. And because of that, there's an expansion, very rapid expansion. That rapid transition from liquid phase to gaseous phase, leading to very rapid expansion itself, can compromise the integrity of the vessel, leading to catastrophic failure of the tank. This is one of the biggest risk in dealing with the LPG. Uh, in some cases, uh, it could have a pool fire around. Um, you can see there's a band wall around. That's one of the precautions for LPG storage. You must have this band wall. In case of failure, uh, the liquid phase should be contained within this area and not running around the whole site. Now, let's look briefly about the condensate. This condensate storage tanks, condensate is more stable than the LPG. But what is one of the biggest risk with the condensate? This tank is, you are seeing, it's what we call, they use an engineering technology called the floating roof design. So even though you see this whole tank, if the product is half full, the roof of the tank that you are seeing outside, there's another roof inside and rolls down and up according to the level of the product in the tank. So around that inner roof, there is a seal that is surrounding the plate of the inner roof. When this product is being uh, loaded out and the level is reducing, the tank roof will go down, rolling through uh, the shell wall of the inner shell. And this seal, over time, can be compromised. The exterior tank you are seeing here, you can see here there are some vents. So it's designed such that the vape, when this product, there's some amount of vaporization of it because it's not completely stable, those vapors come out through this vent. When the seal inside the roof rolling or the uh, around the inner seal uh, roof is compromised, meaning you're going to have more vapors escaping. Uh, also, uh, Safety data has shown that there's a lot of fires with these tanks that result from damage of the, the rim seal, which I just spoke about. And you can see some of the fire fighting measures. What you see around the tank, the rings are firefighting uh, sprinkler system. And these red pipes connect to what we call the firefighting deluge valves. Uh, delete valves that will pump firefighting water to sprinkle the tank in case of fire. So more common hazards, uh, people maintenance work, um, dealing with uh, various equipment. Uh, you can have electrical hazards from the electrical control centers, which is also a common hazard. I'm sure some of you or all of you know what we are seeing. Uh, this is a pig. These two equipment are both pigs. 
uh, pegs uh, for pipeline internal gauging, uh, for cleaning and uh, integrity checks. For example, this pig here is typically for cleaning. You can see some brushes on it and some uh, uh, material like foam and plastic at the edges that help in the cleaning. This one you can see is more equipped uh, with other items. Uh, this is uh, equipment that help to check the internal integrity for the pipe. So it's used for cleaning pipeline, both onshore and offshore. So the picture I show you this pig, for example, uh, after cleaning, you can see how it looks. This was used during one of the cleaning of shore pipeline. And uh, this was when it was being pulled out from the pig receiver. Now, one of the hazards for the pigging operation is that you can never know what you are receiving until you receive it. This operation, for example, we do not expect to receive this amount of sludge. This sludge, uh, you see it just black coating, you never know. It can contain what we call um, low specific activity radioactive material because there's evidence that some of the well formations where they produce the oil and gas, some of those formations can contain naturally occurring radioactive material like uranium and titanium and others. So if that well they are producing the oil and gas from contains this naturally occurring radioactive material, it can find its way through the processing as part of the residual you are receiving in this kind of uh, slug. Um, other common hazards in the workplace, you can see uh, this operation is about cleaning the offshore pipeline, um, commissioning it. And so the water that after construction, uh, the slug of water uh, in it, it has to be pumped out. This is not something that can be received by the plant. So there's a temporary arrangement to divert this into a safe place for collection. So this kind of activity is temporal, but it involves hazards such as pressure because there's pressure used in the pigging operation. The pressure normally behind those pigs, you can have either the gas or something else pushing the, the pigs because you need momentum to break pigs out. Uh, some other construction, oil and gas construction risk, you can see this involves a lot of uh, work at height. For, for example, construction of LPG tanks, you get to have personnel climbing up and doing welding and others. A uh, lot of uh, material with pinpoints and uh, very rough uh, walking areas around. You could, uh, if it's pipeline construction, you could have a situation where you encounter rocks and you have to blast, even though you are not in mining. Blasting is normally done a lot in the mining. Uh, but in this case, in oil and gas construction onshore, you could uh, encounter rocks on the right of way and you have to do blasting. You can see this was a blasting carried out uh, the picture was taken after the blast, so you can see some of the rock pieces and the, the cables the, that were used to ignite the blast material. It could include heavy lifting activities, uh, lifting over 100 tons of uh, equipment for installation, which should be properly uh, planned to control the accidents of the operation. It could be within marine environment. For those of you who might be working uh, with uh, oil and gas companies that are into production, you could work offshore. Uh, this is, a, is the vessel we use it for the, we, I think this one was the pipeline vessel for the offshore pipeline. So uh, you could have a lot more risk about this operation, not necessarily 
only just the vessel itself, but within the pipeline lane activity itself, either transferring the pipe pipes from the the supply vessel to the lay vessel or moving personnel from uh, crew change vessels to the vessel because it can be quite uh, risky to do those kind of transfers, especially if the weather is not stable. You can have a number of operations for pipeline lane offshore. For example, the vessel you see, uh, I just shoot here. Inside this vessel that was laying the pipe, you will see this is where the pipe welding takes place. So they pick, you pick the piping you see here and route it through, there's an entrance here and the laying, the welding happens down on uh, this deck. And uh, it rolls off uh, into the sea. This is the stinger on the vessel. This stinger, uh, is used for guiding the pipe as you are welding and the vessel shifts forward the pipe is guided through this thing into the seabed if there's any doubt about the condition of the pipe you have to send divers down to check the condition of the piping and that can be a bit hazardous also Let's look at some of the elements in the safety management system. Um, first of all, you need to appreciate the business value for safety before you appreciate the safety management system. In corporate, running corporate business, uh, value business value can be seen as measurable hidden assets and qualities of the organization that determines the health and well-being of the organization itself. So any activity or initiative that benefits uh, in a way that reflect the values of the organization in a manner that the costs involved in that activity or endeavor at ways um, sorry, the value at which the cost, it means there's some value addition. Traditionally, it's easy to measure the business value of certain endeavors than others. So some tangible values include profitability, which is done by finance. This is easy to tell when you invest a certain amount into an activity and make uh that amount plus X amount is easy to tell the profitability or the market share or productivity and the growth of the business. Some other endeavors are quite intangible or hidden values, like compliance level of the organization, the reputation, the brand, employee morale, retention or tal talent retention or work, uh, worker or employee turnover. Um, safety is more situated in the hidden values in terms of the business value of safety is situated more in the hidden values than the tangible ones. Even though in some cases you can be able to have some tangible value for safety. Uh, according to some experts in the industry, if you think safety is expensive, then you try accidents because the cost of the accident, the direct cost is just like the iceberg. The direct cost is what you see and the indirect cost of the accident is much, much bigger, which you cannot see. And if you appreciate it in this way, you will understand the business value of safety. Some principles used in safety management system, which we drive across the organization. There's a basic principle 
you do what we call you plan, you do by implementing the things you plan. You have a way to check the effectiveness of what you say you will do and you act to improve. So what do you do to ensure this system is implemented? The leadership commitment of the organization is very important element for implementing the safety management system. If you go to the organization, and uh, let's say the topmost person, for example, our CEO is not interested in health and safety, there's no way you can implement a safety management system. Or you need to also ensure that uh, you understand your hazards and risk properly. So you prioritize your actions. This is another key element. I told you in the beginning about some of the hazards associated with oil and gas, especially the material that we deal with. So this is what we are talking about. When you understand this risk, you dis decide the control measures and you must manage the risk by implementing those measures. And then when something happens, you will learn and improve. In oil and gas, we have one concept we call the inherent safety in design. So safety is not a bolt on endeavor. From the project inception, you must incorporate safety throughout all the phases of the project. So uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with what uh, the model called the Swiss cheese model, where this uh, concept says that uh, you have some, what we call layers of defenses or layers of protection. When you have a hazard, in between the hazard and the target, there's layers of protection that must work correctly to ensure that the hazard will not reach the target. But because we are not in a perfect world, some of these layers of defenses may have weaknesses. You will not have an accident as long as the weaknesses in these layers are not aligned in, in the sense that if uh, an accident scenario is planned and um, it's planned for preventing it from happening, those layers you have put in place must make sure even though they are not perfect, they cannot all be perfect, that they do not all become compromised. So in the design phase, you must take into consideration the characteristics of the products and design your facility to handle that. Um, some of the layers in the oil and gas will include the design startup procedures. You have to train operators to be competent. You have to have integrity checks for the equipment to make sure they function very well. There must be devices that can warn people of danger, like alarms. Uh, and then some devices designed in a way to act automatically in case uh, uh, the human operator, uh, you know, ignores the warning, especially if it's a very high risk issue. And then you must provide safety equipment to be able to respond in terms of emergency. Let's look at some cases for failure of safety management system. Uh, in the list I provided in terms of major accidents in the industry, one was the BP Texas City explosion. This incident in schematic, this brief schematic explains the Texas City explosion. What was happening? They were they had just finished some shutdown maintenance, and they were starting up the plant. The operators on duty were supposed to start up this particular unit. This unit is supposed to, is a tower that handles one of the intermediate products. Uh, it's called raffinate. It's like they use it for producing. Uh, one of their products and is similar to the behavior is similar to petrol or gasoline. So 
there's, there's a normal level when you bring in the liquid, the flammable liquid hydrocarbon into this tower. In normal operation, they were not supposed to exceed six feet high. And maximum, if it exceeds six feet high, it should not exceed about nine feet high. But a lot of things went wrong. Mistakes were made in the startup. And the operators filled this tower to 100 and about 100 and over 150 feet high, close to almost 100% full with liquid and start to heat this. You can understand when you have flammable liquid heated up, what will happen? It will vaporize and you're going to have overpressure. And this overpressure caused the relief valve to open and dump this hot flammable liquid through a vent stack, not a flare, vent stack. This vent stack is open to atmosphere with no flame on it. So they discharge this hot, let's say hot petrol boiling through this on site. And there was an ignition and uh, explosion. We can look at the details later, but you can see clearly something is wrong with this. The investigation that was done pointed the root cause to leadership commitment. You will ask the question because there were errors about the operators, but why leadership commitment? First of all, there were budget cuts. When the BP bought this facility, they bought it from another operator, Aromco or so. In those days, when the facility was being built, those times the engineering technology was not so advanced as at now. So they had situations where you could design and, and link a process unit such as this tower to a vent stack, which is not a flare. Currently, you can't do this because it's substandard engineering. But as they operated this facility and the technology change or engineering advanced, they were aware of this the risk that there could be chance that this accident scenario can happen. But because of financial commitment to reduce cost of operation, they did not. And in their books, they put the commitment to operators adhering to operating procedures as one of their strategies to control this risk. This is not acceptable because, as I explained, the hierarchy of control procedures are way down the hierarchy. You cannot uh, relegate risk control from eliminating the hazard completely and go for operating procedure personnel adhering to operating procedure. This is not acceptable. So that was one of the issues. Second commitment from leadership was that they reduce the manpower from the facility to one person per shift. And the day the accident happened, the operator on duty had been working. The day the accident happened was his 30th day on road running 12 hour shift. Fatigue alone is enough to cause this guy not to pay attention to the level in the tower. Uh, number two, there was a culture of casual compliance throughout DP itself because they had created a situation where rules were meant to be obeyed by only the junior people and not the senior people. For example, they had a policy on site. You cannot pack a certain area because of control of ignition sources but they noticed the supervisors would park their vehicles in those areas. Uh, they also noticed structural issues. In fact, a number of things went wrong. So, but the bottom line is uh, referring to leadership commitment. Hazard identification issue in terms of failure. In this uh, site, what happened was that they finished the facility constructing the facility, and they were now about commissioning. In the commissioning, the feed was supposed to route through, as I'm showing here, from here through valve number 1113 and go this way, okay, uh, into this unit, this blue unit. But they made a mistake in the position of this valve 11 and 13. Instead of being open position, they were in closed position. So when the feed came in, this is um, 
quite um, under pressure because from the production well. So when these two valves were closed, there was no way for this feed to go other than to use this route. This is a bypass. This bypass goes straight to a third stage separator, which was not designed to handle the pressures from the world. So when this gas and liquid, it's actually a mixture of gas and liquid, went through the third stage uh, separator. Because it's not designed to handle the pressures from the well, the, the piping work network was compromised and there was a rupture and fires and explosion. You can see that if they had done risk assessment before the startup, this should be clearly identified. One of the practices we do here in Ghana Gas, whether we are commissioning new facility or it's after shutdown maintenance, is what we call the work down. You have to use a checklist. The checklist must be developed by the supervisors for each process line and mark the critical valves that must be aligned. And someone must walk through this, holding the checklist and, and tick that I went to check this valve, it is in the correct position. If they had done this simple operational readiness uh, check, this accident can simply be avoided. This is the risk issue that should simply be controlled. Another example of failures, management of change. On this side, there is a gas processing plant similar to what Ghana Gas is doing. Along the operations, uh, they realized that there was buildup of solids uh, in this heat exchanger, which was causing process upsets. Uh, so what the operations team decided to do was that they decided to inject a chemical upstream of this heat exchanger and the chemical succeeded to break in breaking the debris in the heat exchanger. But what happened was that this chemical reacted with uh, some of the debris in, in, in doing its job and that compromised the thickness of the piping and caused the piping to fail, leading to a fire and explosion. Management of change. In terms of oil and gas operation, if you are changing either equipment or operational procedures or introducing things like new chemical, this risk must be assessed. If they had involved competent chemical engineers to assess this chemical, probably they would have realized this chemical has the potential to cause failure of this piping maybe due to stress corrosion, because this chemical probably reacted with those debris to cause very severe corrosion uh, over the period due to the use of the chemical. So uh, formal management of change procedures must be in place to at, uh, assess these kind of uh, changes. Managing uh, risk also in relating to operating procedures. On this side, just uh, we don't do heating before uh, transport. Uh, I think Albert is on the call, he can confirm that. But on this side, they, they, one of their storage tanks, the, they store um, one of the products. Uh, the practice is that if you want to transfer the product out of the tank, you have to do circulation first. You do circulation. You see the piping here is for circulating the product within the tank. What's the purpose for the circulation is to mix because they notice this is the product. When you leave it over time, the water settles out into the bottom of the tank. So they do this circulation before they start heating and getting ready to transport or load. But the, this practice of heating, um, circulating before heating and transfer was not written in the procedure. Uh, the supervisors did not write this in the procedure. It is due to their experience in running this unit. The operator there and the supervisors knew this was the best way to avoid the water settling and heating. 
Why? Because if you leave this water to settle and you heat, what will happen? The water will reach boiling point. And when the water reach boiling point, it will now overheat the hydrocarbon liquid and increase the pressure. But they transferred this uh, operator to a different section of the plant and they brought a new person. Because they did not write this procedure, this uh, uh, action in the procedure, the new person also was not briefed by the old guy about this particular critical safety operation. So one of the days he decided, and they did this over some few days and the water had separate, uh, settled down. So he went to turn on the heating medium and the water boiled, overheated the hydrocarbon liquid, pressurized the tank, blew off the, the roof of the tank and there was a fire and explosion on, on the side. Learning from experience, um, you can see um, this site, what happened in terms of incident investigations. They had a, a terminal, the store, like what BOST does in Ghana. This is a company, that's what they do. They store refined products and transport to different areas within the uh, country for usage. So this storage facility is the old one and they built a new storage facility. But what they did was that in the old design, the pressure of the design maximum, the pressures the piping network can take was designed to about 100 and uh, 1,300 uh, PSI, which is maybe around 80 bar, I would say. And they designed the new uh, facility. They rate, downrated the pressure to about 740 PSI, which is maybe around 50 bar. Let's estimate it that way. So you can see there's a significant pressure uh, rating difference between the old storage uh, uh, depot and the new one. What they did was that they then put uh, some um, emergency shutdown valve to protect the new facility because the piping were underrated. And they designed it such that when the pressure is approaching the 740 PSI, this uh, valve here should open and divert the flow to the divert tank, which was designed to contain these pressures. But when they started the commission, they started operating. What they noticed is that the inlet shutdown valve, which is supposed to protect this uh, terminal, uh, closed several times, interrupting operate their operation activity. Instead of them to investigate why, it is closing a number of times, several times. They did not investigate this issue and they kept this as a normal. They normalized this issue. And one day when this valve shut, the pressure, the, let me add that, even the number, the number of several times this valve shut, because of the sudden shut of this valve, and it is a liquid product, the pressure in this pipeline surged close to the 1,300 PSI, but yet they did not investigate this thoroughly to resolve this issue. So one of the days when this valve shut, it actually caused the 1,300 PSI section on the piping to fail. And because it's a liquid product, the product went through a river and the river water carried this flammable liquid downstream. It ignited and threatened the safety of a village that was living near this river bank. So you can see clearly if they are investigated, they can learn some lessons from the previous shots up to 41 times they could have prevented this. So incident investigation is one of the key things in oil and gas operations that must be taken seriously 
lessons must be shared with the key personnel. Safe systems of work. What are safe systems of work? For oil and gas, an industry like oil and gas, you cannot just be doing things anyhow. So everything must be controlled. In our plant, any non-routine activity in the plant area must be controlled by what we call permit to work system. People must clearly define what not that activity is, what methods they are using. You identify the hazard that can emanate from this and assess the risk properly. And you get a formal approval of this work based on review of the control measures defined. And you will get this authorization based on the time frame you are expected to execute the work. If you cannot execute the work within this time frame, you have to go back for validation or approval. So the people like Michael and Albert and Co in the plant as plant managers are the ones who will review this permit and approve for you to carry out the work. Typically, we have two main types of work activities. If any work activity is capable of generating ignition sources, maybe is the welding or cutting operation that can generate flame or ignition or hot surfaces, you will use what we call the hot work permit. And then if it is not any activity, the activity does not involve ignition sources, we call it the cold work permit. This permit will define for you all the precautions you need to take, depending on the nature of the work you are trying to take. Undertake. This permit to work was one of the causes, because the permit to work system failed, it was one of the causes of the accident uh, of the Piper Alpha, which I mentioned here when I was talking about the list of the accidents because they had one of their compressor taken down for maintenance. Uh, and the permit to work system was not rigorous, so the change in crew did not realize it, and they went to start it, and it caused an accident. Uh, some key aspects of the permit to work that must be enforced, it must be used anytime there is a non-routine work activity in the plant. So. Normal operation is defined according to operating procedure. Those are not under permit to work control, but anything outside of normal operating procedure must be covered under the permit to work. There must be formal suspension and revalidation of the permit. If the time frame elapses, what was agreed is your working time. If it elapses, you will suspend the permit or you go back for revalidation. It must be reviewed by competent personnel like the plant managers to ensure that the controls are adequate to prevent any accidents. Some of the permits may require that some critical systems will be isolated, like electrical system or mechanical or any process unit that they want to work on. That isolation must be done by somebody competent in that area, not any other person. So an engineer, if you are doing work on a system that requires electrical isolation, if you are not the electrical engineer, you cannot be the one to isolate this unit. If you are doing it is a process unit and you are not in, in operations, you cannot be the one to do this isolation because you are not a competent person in that area. Issuance of the permit must be coordinated by a centralized focal point. In our system here at Ghana Gas, the permit to work is coordinated by the HSC department. So we have one of our office, general office, where the permit to work coordinator sits. And that's where if you need to do any work, you must go there to initiate the process for the permit. The control room personnel or engineers must receive copies of all permits issued and they must be communicated to, and they have to keep track of all works that are currently uh, on hold or ongoing uh, by keeping track of all permits that are live. And this must be done using a dedicated board so that you don't go looking for something and you'll be confused, you don't know what it is. The Piper Alpha incident I mentioned, for example, 
there were two permits on that compressor. One was on the pressure safety valve. One was for routine uh, preventive maintenance. They, they were running pump B. So pump A, uh, they were running compressor A, uh, compressor B. Compressor A was the one taken out for uh, maintenance during the day shift. For, they initiated a permit for routine PM, which was going to take two weeks. But at the same time, they noted they need to service the pressure safety valve. So they raised another permit uh, for the pressure safety valve. That should have been finished that same day and installed back. But the pressure safety valve uh, work servicing did not complete on that same shift. So when the day shift was closing, the supervisor in charge of this work went to the control room uh, to hand over the permit to to the control room supervisor. But when he went, he was engaged in something else and he just dropped the permit and left. He didn't talk to anybody. So in the night, when the night shift took over, so nobody knew where this guy kept this permit. Uh, so when the night shift took over, this uh, compressor B, they were running trip in the night. On the oil production platform, when you trip, you, there's a time frame you must come back online. Otherwise, it will take weeks a month to start the platform so they don't want that to happen so they were on the heat to bring on the the compressor b the compressor a that has been taken down for maintenance but they didn't know uh, the pressure safety valve had been removed um they only thought the only permit on it was the one for pm maintenance because that one was on file the supervisor saw that when he didn't see the one that was for pressure safety valve, and they had put a blind flange on where they removed the pressure safety valve. But this blind flange, they just put about two bolts on it, not properly proper blind, rated for that unit and not properly bolted. So it's not for pressurizing this uh, compressor and they went to start it. And that's where the gas came out and exploded and caused a lot of destruction. So if they had even written the permit, the life permit, on the board, because then he will not go looking for the permit itself. Logger tag out is one of the safety, uh, safe systems of work must be implemented. Anytime you do isolation of electrical or mechanical or process unit, you must lock and tag uh, uh, using different uh, color codes if possible uh, for different personnel to ensure that nobody accidentally starts the unit uh, when the, this unit is down. If Piper Alpha had, had even done logger tag out on the compressor, it, 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 it possibly could not be started. Uh, let's look at emergency response planning and we end. So in emergency response planning, uh, you take you are taking all these measures to make sure no accident happen, but you can never tell things can go wrong and uh, a big incident can happen. So you have to have evacuation procedures. When something happens, the priority is to make sure personnel on site are safe. So you must define evacuation procedures. If there's an emergency in the plan, people must know where to pass to exit the site and go to a safe location such as the assembly point um, to be briefed. There must be warnings uh, and uh, detection systems in the plant. For example, gas detectors, flame detectors, in case of leak or fire, there must be uh, automatic detection and warning of uh, the personnel in charge of operating the plant. There must be means for firefighting within the plant. In case of uh, fire, for example, there should be means to fight the fire. I showed you the range on the LPG tanks and the condensate tanks. They are all designed to fight fire on those tanks. And along the plant, we have what we call the hydrant system uh, with uh, hoses and others on standby. And we have trained personnel who have been trained and they are retrained refresher in terms of refresher training with the support of the Ghana National Fire Service. Uh, this picture you are seeing is not an accident, it was a drill. So you have to do drills to practice the, the arrangement. So you can see this, in this picture on your right, this uh, uh, 
were, you, what you are seeing is not gas, it's the water. We were testing the the dilute system on the LPG tank, so you can see the water showers on the tank. Uh, this is the what you are seeing here. These are the dilute valves. Uh, this one is with the um, uh, the pressurizing the fire water going to the tanks. Uh, so I think this one is for the condensate loading tanks. It's a foam system. The condensate loading tank, because of the, yeah, it's a hydrocarbon liquid stored there. This uh, red pipe you see is connected to uh, a foam tank. So in case of fire on the condensate tank, the, the foam will be released into the ring seal uh, area to contain the fire within the tank. There must be means for medical evacuation because if people get injured, uh, you need to be able to provide uh, immediate uh, medical attention to them. And uh, this must be practiced. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I'll come to an end of my presentation. James, uh, you can take over. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Yaya. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take we'll take the second presentation from Mr. Sylvester. I'm told the CEO will join us shortly for uh, a brief remarks. But then uh, until he joins us, we will we'll, we'll take uh, the second presentation of gas tariff pricing from Mr. Sylvester Enumi Kudu. Then we'll do a combined Q and A for the two for the two topics. So, Mr. Sylvester, if you can hear me, over to you. Hello, Mr. Sylvester. Hello, Mr. Sylvester. Wow, it seems it's Hello. Yes. So you can, can hear, hear me, me now. Yes, please. Kindly, kindly, please go go ahead and share your screen. To the attendees, please you can drop your Great. questions in the Q and A box as the presentation goes on, right? And then I'll ask. There is one for uh, Mr. Yayaba. I'll ask after Mr. Sylvester's presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Kudio. Over to you. Sylvester. Hello, Mr. Kudio. Hello. Wow. Yes, Sylvester, please, if you are talking, we can't hear you. Wow. Hello, Mr. Kudu. Hello. Hello.
Okay, it seems it seems we can't hear Mr. Kujo. So I'll 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 call back Mr. Jasui Haya so that we can take your Q and A. Once Mr. Sylvester is back online, then we give him the platform, right? Yeah, James, I'm 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 okay for questions if Sylvester is not ready. I can take my questions. All right, all right, all right. So the first question is, is it the chemicals injected into the heat heat exchanger mix with debris leading to explosion? So that's number one for for you. Sorry, can you take the question again? Okay, so God bless Ofosuhine Apent in his action. Is it always the chemicals injected from the heat exchanger mix, mixed with debris leading to the explosion? He's asking what are what are some of the causes of explosion in uh, from the heat exchangers? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay, so I think he's asking connection with the case study I showed, right? Right. Good. So um, in the case of this incident, the corrosion was caused by the, the the chemical, but in some cases, in terms of failure of piping or vessels, it's not just chemical injection. You will see that even some of the case studies are showed. For example, where they diverted the incoming feed to the third stage separator that was not designed to hold those pressures just by doing that cause failure of the piping, right? So if you exceed, if the pressure exceeds the design or the, uh, yeah, the, the capacity of the piping in terms of the maximum operating pressures it can take, that means you can also have a situation the piping or vessel will fail. So it's not just when you introduce chemical. But of course, some chemicals can cause corrosion. So if you have a situation where you are going to introduce a chemical that has potential to cause corrosion, that must be properly examined. In this case, it was not examined. You can see that that chemical they introduced is not part of, it was not initially part of their operations uh, consumables. It was because they were experiencing uh, blockage in the heat exchanges. So they decided to introduce this chemical to break this uh, blockage and allow proper uh, process conditions. In terms of safety, one will say that the chemical is not the problem. In fact, the problem is that they should have examined what was causing the blockage. Maybe it's not even necessary any chemical maybe there's something happening upstream one of the upstream equipments probably is not functioning well and causing this so the whole um, case study in this case is not to attribute the failure to the chemical is that when you're making changes in plant operations you have to examine the change you are making, whether it is equipment, chemical, personnel, or whatever, you have to examine that change properly before you implement. So, as I said, it's not just chemical introductions that can cause piping failure. If you exceed the pressures, you can cause failure of the piping also. All right. Thank you. Let's take the second one. Asante Gideon is asking, thanks to Ghana Gas for this very educative presentation. Opel will continue into the years ahead. Has Ghana Gas acquired an international award for its high, high oriented safety operation? Uh, under the distinguished leadership of our CEO, Dr. Ben Asante, Ghana Gas implemented uh, our safety management system to meet the standard requirements for the ISO 45001, which is the international standard for safety management system. We achieved this certification in April, 2022. So uh, at the moment we are certified, our safety management system is certified 
to the highest international standard. The ISO 45001 is the highest international standard you can find currently in terms of health and safety management system. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Beneza is asking, what are what are some of the challenges being faced in ensuring general workforce buying concerning safety at Ghana Gas? And then the second one is asking, what is the approach of Ghana Gas as far as mental health is concerned? Wow. A double barrel, a double barrel question for you. Well, uh... The participation of workers in the safety management system is one of the key pillars uh, and elements in implementing a successful safety management system because, I mean, the workers are the ones doing the work. So there's no way you can have a safety management system without participation of workers. And of course, the question is asking in terms of challenges. Challenges are abound, uh, and it is not peculiar to Ghana gas. The same human psychology that affects change in any organization uh, affect uh, Ghana gas as well. So uh, when you are bringing changes, for example, introducing our uh, safety management system to meet the international standard, we have to do a lot of education, sensitization, letting people understand the benefit to themselves and the company uh, and having very uh, regular ways to consult and engage workers and bring them apart with some of the things that are happening uh, in, in, uh, some of the ways. So, for example, we have uh, regular health and safety awareness trainings we do every two weeks uh, for the staff uh, and also having some motivational uh, packages in terms of recognizing the contribution of workers as to health and safety. But the challenges, they, they, they are always there. So as I said, it's, it's, I will not really emphasize on particular uh, issues, but I, it's everywhere. It's not only Ghana gas. Anytime you are dealing with human beings, uh, there are issues of bringing change. Driving change is difficult everywhere. But uh, for us, we are lucky that we got the buy-in of the staff and we were successful in implementing the system. All right. Thank you. It says... Mr. Sylvester is back, but then let's finish with your Q&A. Uh, Samuel Gamo is asking, how do you prevent high storage tank temperature? That's number one. Are chemicals involved during pipeline pigging? Number two, and then number three, what specific type of gas detector do you use at Ghana Gas? So a three, a three, a three, one question for you. If you want me to take it one by one, I can. So with the prevention of a high storage, tank temperature. I mean, uh, I'm not too sure which product is uh, talking about, uh, but in our case, uh, our ambient conditions themselves uh, are quite okay in terms of the products that we handle. Our LPG tank is protected by, uh, uh, we have uh, a cooling water sump available in case the temperature increases above the storage conditions. The operators can shower the tank without necessarily activating the firefighting system. There's a dedicated cooling system for that. But we have never used it because the atmospheric conditions have, uh, are, all, are okay. So I think that's the only product that would have required this kind of uh, cooling. Uh, we don't have that situation at all. Uh, in terms of uh, type of gas detectors, there are different type of gas detectors we use. In the main plant, Within the plant area, there are fixed detectors. Those fixed detectors uh, detect uh, 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 flammable gas uh, like the methane, propane, uh, and uh, ethane. The calibration gas is predominantly methane. So because our main main gas is methane, when they are calibrating, they use a, a mix. It's a the calibration gas is a mix, but it's, it's predominantly methane. The other components are very less, so it can detect these ones. So that's for the fixed gas detectors in the plant. Those ones are part of what we call the fire and gas system. Uh, so in terms of detection, the fire and gas system includes the gas detector, 
which is the fixed ones I'm talking about, and then flame detectors. Flame detectors are installed in certain areas that have potential for hydrocarbon uh, 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 fires in terms of generating flame, especially if there are liquid possibility of liquid fires. Uh, then we have heat, some uh, heat detectors in some areas of the plant that has the potential to generate heat. Uh, these ones are wired to a, a dedicated computer that can shut down the plant if those detectors are activated. But aside those ones, uh, for work activities, you will use what we call portable gas detectors. Those ones are handheld and they are also calibrated similarly like the fixed one. So the handheld one, in addition to the flammable gases, they also are calibrated to, de to detect gases like uh, oxygen, uh, carbon monoxide, and uh, H2S, uh, because uh, maybe the work area people are going to carry away present the potential for any other gas other than our process gas. So those ones detect these additional gases. So I think uh, this should be enough for the gas detector. And uh, the what was the third question from him? The chemicals involved during pipeline pegging. Well, uh, I mean, this may be a chemical process uh, engineer issue, but in terms of safety, what I know in terms of chemicals, the if they inject any chemical during the pegging, is for a particular purpose. For example, if it's an offshore pipeline, when they construct the offshore pipeline, for example. Uh, they'll probably see water inside already when you're commissioning. You have to push out that sea water. To do that, you must have, and you use your gas to push, right, the pigs. So when you are installing, putting the pigs in the pipeline, what they do is that they, they put a chemical that is capable of preventing hydrate formation. That is making sure that the chemical is capable of... Um, uh, preventing the gas uh, re reacting to water in a way that can cause hydrate. I'm sure those of you who are chemical engineers, you understand hydrate it can damage the pipeline because if it forms, that's it. it will, you have to cut it off or something because it's difficult to dissolve it. So they probably will put chemical like uh, monoethylene uh, glycol. Uh, it is one of the chemicals we use in our plant. We use the glycol in our process for dehydration. So they can put uh, glycol for dehydration purpose. Uh, also, uh, because of the seawater, sometimes they can put uh, corrosion inhibitors to just prevent uh, corrosion, internal corrosion because of seawater already in the piping. So these are some of the chemicals they will use. They, they do not pose serious safety risk uh, in terms of safety itself, you know, uh, these are just uh, to help in the operation. All right. Mr. Patrick Justice Abuti is asking, hello, Jasu. So what was the major cause of the Piper Alpha disaster? Was it a cause that a shift team didn't follow the logout tagout procedure or some other operational procedure? And secondly, the Piper Alpha and the blowout on the Macondo World Disaster Deep Horizon, Deepwater Horizon, are these issues similar or mutually exclusive? Thank you. Okay, so um, the, there are multiple causes for the Piper Alpha incident, um, but the one of the main causes is the breakdown of their permit to work system, as I told you. If their permit to work system had worked the way it's supposed to work, or the way it's in. you will notice that the nine shift would have known that the pressure safety valve uh, on the compressor number A has been removed. Uh, and so they could not try to start it when compressor number B was had trip. Basically, because the permit got lost when it's not supposed to be missing, the control room should have control of this permit, but they, apparently they didn't. So you can see the immediate issues are the permit, but there are underlying issues. Uh, in the application, if you watch, uh, there are a lot of information on Piper Alpha. The resources go beyond the operational level. So we are talking about the operational level, the permit work field, right? 
But beyond that, there are issues of their organizational culture where the management seems not to pay attention to health and safety. Uh, even sometimes when they had audit actions, they did not pay attention to them and all that. Similarity to Makondo, uh, the common saying that most of the major accidents, there's um, resemblance in the causes. Yeah, because if you if you study most of the big, big accidents, it always relates to a number of common factors. Uh, in that organizations are not learning lessons from those ones that are suffering the incidents. And that's how it's been over the years. So Makondo, you, you will see that uh, there were cuts, they had cuts in their budgets in terms of safety measures uh, and things like that which is similar to some of the major accidents that happened, but also they also uh, had issues with uh, operational level controls, including the penalty work and things like that. So they are quite similar in nature of uh, causes. Yeah. And it's not only the accidents, the causes uh, are the uh, to common, common failures. All right, Mr. Blaine is asking, what are the safety measures put in place to cater for those staying closer to the gas plant? I'm sure he's referring to the community, right? So Exactly, the community, yeah. Yeah, inciting the plant, normally you will have what we call the exclusion zones determined. This is part of the safety studies that must be done at the uh, engineering stage. That will help you acquire the the amount of land space you need. Um, so you will do very serious uh, technical safety studies. It's not a simple safety risk assessment I explained in my presentation. There are different types of risk assessment. This one, if you want to determine those kind of risk issues, you have to use what we call quantitative uh, risk assessment. They will do fire modeling. They will do explosion modeling. Tell you the farthest that uh, the major has that area in your side, how far it can go when there's an accident. These are the things you use to determine your exclusion zone. Fire, uh, your buffer, including these areas. As long as you keep those uh, protected, uh, it means that even if there's an accident, the community should not suffer the accident. Um, in our case, uh, we do periodic education in the nearby sensitize them to be aware some of the things they themselves are not supposed to do. For example, encroaching on our facility or land, it means you are putting your risk yourself at risk because if there's an accident and you have encroached, uh, meaning you are now in the danger zone, carrying out certain activities near our facility like burning bushfire. If there's any gas leak and you go burning your bushfire, it means you are creating a chance for in the area. So um, the education uh, is part of our plan we do with them. Uh, we engage with the opinion leaders in terms of uh, any other uh, specific safety measures when we want to carry a specific activity like maintenance. If we want to do heavy flaring because of shutdown maintenance, that week, the community liaison officers will do and sensitize them that this week we are going to carry our maintenance and you see the flare will go up, but don't. All right. I think I think we have we have about four more questions, but then uh, we are running out of time. Let's take Sylvester's presentation and then we may come back to wrap up. Uh, the so. two All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Jasu. Mr. Sylvester, if you can hear me, the floor is yours. Hello, Mr. Sylvester. Wow, he's off again.
That's the last time you can hear me. The floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear now. If you can go ahead and share uh, your screen. Uh, great. I, I'm really sorry about the terrible nature of the network. That's fine. Okay, can you see? Yes, please, we can. Good, so good afternoon. And like I said, let me apologize for the erraticity of the network. So mine is to have a discussion with you on the gas tariffs and then NGL pricing. I believe in the course of one week, all the conversation you've had leads us to a certain point. How do you manage, I had to discuss with you, risk. How do you manage risk so that you do not incur cost that is unintended? At the end of the day, yes, businesses so just a minute. Are, Can you please do your, uh, hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, just put it on a, a presentation mode. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you. So, all that we've been discussing this week leads us to one thing. How do you ensure that the utilities within the gas market are able to grow as a growing concern? And one key fundamental variable when it comes to growing concern is pricing rights and pricing sustainably. So you need to price in a manner that will ensure sustainability. And I always want to start the presentation with this chart. And indeed, once we all understand this chart, perhaps the discussion on pricing would have been done. You will notice that the top line shows a certain meandering and up and down. That's basically volatility. Then the question becomes, is volatility good when it comes to pricing? You will notice that the, there's a stable line, more like a flat, a flat line, that from November 27, 2023, all the way to 10th of January 2024, you will notice that the price has been relatively stable. Then the question will also be asked, is that hot will yield to optimum revenue or is that the best for industry? So what I intend doing this afternoon is to walk you through the objective of this discussion and then we will engage in a very bit, a little bit of concept definitions. Then you look at the nature and behavior of the two markets. Bear in mind, you are looking at tariff, gas tariff, and NGLs pricing. Gas market is different from the NGL market. So at the end of the day, we are looking at two markets and their separate pricing regime. So I intend to go into the behavior and the nature of that market just so that when we are discussing price, you'll be able to situate it within its proper context. Then you look at the purpose of tariff and pricing mechanism. Of the semester, you are 
I think he still handling the next challenges. Exactly. Yeah. Mr. Kujo. Hello, Mr. Kujo. Wow. Mr. Kudio. Wow. Uh. Oh. And this, please bear with us. I think our our speaker is having challenges with the network.
I think he is here to join us. Uh, he's here to, to correct his, his network challenges. Mr. Yasu, let's let's continue with you and finish and then finish your 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 part. Uh, right. Andrew is asking, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Please, how often do you conduct drills? That's number one. And then I know that the company educates communities around the facility about it to patients and what could go wrong. But please, have you ever had a drill involving the local communities to make them aware on what to do when something goes wrong? Thank you. Okay. So for the drills, we have a drill plan. For the operational sites, it's normally monthly. Uh, Non-operational sites is quarterly. Um, so that's a drip one for all the operational sites is monthly. And the question on the community, yes, we educate them, as he said, but uh, um, in terms of uh, improving management system, we believe in continual improvement. We are working together through the community relations department, for example, to enhance the emergency response planning for community side. Uh, we are currently, they are trying to identify possible master points and for us to retain a certain level of supplies in case of anything. It's all part of enhancing our emergency response plan. And we have even decided that when we are implementing that we'll include uh, some selected members of the community who are willing to be fire wardens to be part of training. Um, so there's a uh, currently uh, they are aware of the evacuation procedures, but we want to enhance it. That's that's all I can say. All right. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Uh, Asante Gideon is asking. What are some of the software programs that you can use in your operations? I'm sure possibly from the EHS side. Uh, this one, maybe operations or... <laughs> I'm not sure what exactly he meant by that. It was by, yeah, yeah, myself. Okay, let's take, let's take the next one from Andrew Aka. One thing I've learned in my five years in the industry is complacency on the part of most workers. Please, how do you deal with complacency? Come on, Drew. Well, uh, uh, complacency is part of human psychology. It's not um, uh, restricted to one person. Uh, workers are uh, human beings. Uh, human and they I mean, once you become very familiar with every situation, you will normally um, have some complacency. If you drive, for example, and I ask you, uh, your normal route you take from home to work, and you've been planning for maybe three, five years. Uh, if I ask you, what did you see at the roadside at a particular area, you probably will not recall. But if it's a new road, you probably paid attention and you can tell me details, right? It's similar to that, but complacency can be managed when the person is trained and competent and become aware of their own uh, weaknesses, including the, the, the likelihood to be complacent, right? So training is the only solution. You need to make sure the person is competent uh, in terms of training, the skill experience, uh, and knowledge to do their work. Um, knowledge here should include the risk involved in the work, including their complacency uh, being a, a risk factor. The only thing I can say, Andrews, is that normally in incident investigations, you have to try to be a little more subtle in focusing your attention on complacency, because if not, you tend to be blaming the frontline worker, which is one of the uh, very bad precedents that some management always use to punish junior people when accidents happen. 
including the BP Texas explosion I mentioned. When the accident happened, one of the first things they did, they sacked about six of the junior workers and said that, they said what they did is unimaginable. That was the words of the plant manager, that it is unimaginable that someone will fill that tower. That was what they said. But when you look at the details of the issues, uh, as someone being negligent, it's a, some series of failures, and management is part of it and all that. So complacency is a human character, but you can manage it when you are competent people who are aware of the likelihood of the complacency itself. All right. Mr. Santi Gideon is asking, what are some of the developmental projects like schools, hospital, roads, et cetera, that Ghana Gas has undertaken in Ghana, precisely in the Ashanti region? And he's asking, is not being political. Uh, James, uh, this one is outside my scope. Maybe. Exactly, exactly. Myself, being being an avid reader of the news, I'll, I'll, I'll notice that Ghana Gas sponsors uh, Astro Def pitches, school blocks, across 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 the length and breadth of the of the of the country so it's not only limited to ashanti region so mr asante Gideon, just for your information uh oscar is asking please say what measures are put in place to prevent gas leaks within the facility and then two how is the workforce trained to identify and respond to potential gas hazards in their daily operations thank you well, uh, prevention of gas leaks is a general uh, issue. First of all, the as uh, you can see, the the gas, the gases or the gas is supposed to remain in the piping in the vessels and the tanks and not to come out. It's not it. So if if there's a leak, usually, uh, meaning that something has failed, is either a pipe has a hole in it or some valve. Uh, has some issue or a joint. Normally, we call it flange in the plan. Uh, in the technical sense, is not a joint, but it's a joint in common sense where two pipes are are bolted together. That is called flange, right? Usually, if the seals used and the bolts are not of good integrity over time, you can have leaks coming from this or where the valves are are. Uh, also have flanges as well, and the valve itself has a stem that goes into the pipe and if it's compromised because of poor maintenance it can create uh, leaks also where instrumentation like pressure gauges uh, levels gauges uh, meters and switches are installed can also be a situation where uh, if they are not properly maintained they can leaks so maintenance you can see and asset integrity checks is one of the key measures you must have proper maintenance in place to control for example corrosion of the piping or equipment if there's corrosion the metal thickness will reduce over time and it will compromise and start to leak right so maintenance is key operations uh, in terms of procedures is very important all the equipment are uh, designed in a way that you operate them within a certain envelope. There's a low limit and there's an upper limit you should not exceed as an operator. So if you deliberately pressurize a, a vessel or a piping beyond the strength of the, uh, what the designer has said, you are going to cause a situation where you can lose containment. Um, also, physical damage can happen if you have maintenance activities happening and cranes, people bring cranes and other mobile equipment and there are no proper safety measures in place to designate areas they can operate and move around. They can physically damage a piping or something and cause a damage. So all these things um, are part of measures that you need to implement. So the safe systems of work can control maintenance activities in a way that will prevent physical damage. And then your maintenance programs uh, can also help you maintain the integrity of the piping and the vessels to make sure there are no leaks due to corrosion and other integrity issues. And then the operating procedures, the operators must be competent to know the limits within which they have to 
operate each of the units or vessels or tanks or whatever to so that, uh, for example, tanks, when you overfill, you're going to have the product to leak, right? It can come out. So all those are part of the measures. Training of these operators is very important. All right. Then an anonymous attendee is asking, what ISO management systems govern plant operations at Ghana Gas? I don't understand what he's saying, but um, if he's talking about ISO, ISO, yes. standards, uh, ISO standards are normally management system standards. Um, so you they are not really to define technical standards. So in oil and gas operations, there are a number of international codes and standards applied at different stages. So from the design, the designers use international standards and codes in the design itself, okay? So uh, those who are engineers in this session will understand that, uh, for example, I'm not uh, in that area, but they use things like API and others, right? So they tell you, if you are designing a high pressure vessel, thickness and material selection, what to do and all that, right? If you are talking about operations, um, operations have standards they follow in terms of operational procedures, right? But ISO in, uh, management system standards also can be used to manage and uh, drive improvement across the organization in terms of managing um, the system. So for us, uh, the reason why this came up is because someone asked a question about the certifications Ghana has about safety. So safety management system international, the best, the highest international standard currently for health and safety management system is the ISO 45001. So for example, that's the kind of framework we are using to manage safety in Ghana gas. So the elements required, and you normally have independent auditors come to check that you are continuously adhering to the those uh, requirements. And they will, if they find you are not implementing, they will come revoke the certificate. Um, even though this is, because it's a management system standard, it means it cuts across the whole organization on key processes related to the discipline of that standard. So if you are talking about health and safety standard for ISO, the processes related to health and safety is not just done by health and safety department. It cuts across, for example, procurement process for selecting contractors or for selecting suppliers is a health and safety issue. So how you do procurement will fall under this standard. I'm just giving you an example. Maintaining integrity and maintenance becomes a key area because if you don't maintain facilities, somebody else about leaks, right? You're going to have compromised the uh, integrity of the equipment. So this is how the interface is, but you cannot call one standard, ISO standard as oil and gas operation standard. It's just a discipline management system that rather applies. All right. Thank you so much. I think there's one last question. It's saying that given that methane is a pot is, is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 in the short term, what systems are in place to track and prevent methane leakage? Well, so um the first um uh person uh, the the gentleman was about the leaks. I think this is similar because our gas is uh, comprised of predominantly of the methane. So, I mean, the in terms of environmental impact in oil and gas operations and the issue about methane, <clears throat> there are different areas this impact can come from. We have what we call the fugitive emissions. The fugitive emissions will come from when you have things like leaks from flanges, valves, and things like that, okay? So that can cause impact to environment if the leaks are becoming too much in the plant, everywhere there's leak, right? And you're leaking the methane. Or from um, flaring, something like flaring. When you flare, 
uh, flaring has its own impact. But in terms of the methane, uh, when you are flaring, in our case, we actually burn the methane and it convert it to CO2 and uh, vapor and NOx and salt, right? In some cases, we may vent normal vents of gas in case we need to do something. There's a maintenance of a section of uh, a pipeline and where we don't have flare system. It means you vent some amount of gas. But in that case, the control is that you need to vent what is reasonably the minimum volume you cannot do anything about before you can vent. So these are the controls we put in place operationally. Um, once you can deal with fugitive emissions in terms of integrity of the equipment, in operations, anytime there's a situation, apart from normal operational flaring, which is part of the safety measures of the plant, if you need to do maintenance and vent any gas, you must first look at the option of flaring that gas, or if you can't in the situation of the pipeline system where there's no flare system, then that gas you are venting is very, very minimal, meaning you make use of whatever volumes you have until it gets to a point where um, you cannot use, that's when you can bet for maintenance. So I think these are the ways we are using to control the impact on the environment. From All the... right. Thank you so much, Mr. Jasu Yahya. I think we have uh, Mr. Sylvester Kujo on the line. We'll, we'll, we'll take it over from there. Thank you very much, Mr. Yahya. We are most grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes, James. Master. Yes. Let me Please. once again um uh, say I am sincerely sorry for this. It's the network. I'm actually in Accra because of this. Just so that I'll have a stable network, but it's been a disaster. So um the purpose of this is to have a discussion on gas tariff and gas um NGL pricing. And like I said earlier on, we use the term tariff and pricing to connote or to send a signal. And the signal is that one is heavily regulated and the other is more of a free on a free market basis. So the market, the interaction of demand and supply determine how much one will cost. But when it comes to gas, there's a way you have to go through a regulatory process in order to arrive at the tariff. So my intention is to look at the behavior of the market because there are two separate markets and you need to understand the behavior of the market just so that the pricing will be done and done right. Then you look at the importance of pricing because at the end of the day, um, Jasu has taken us through the health and safety bit, but the bottom line is that to maintain your equipment, you need to get your pricing right. So if your pricing is not right, then the bit that he talked about, having to invest or change certain equipment and recalibrate will suffer. So pricing is key and, and very core to the discussion we are having. So I'll try to discuss NGL pricing, the regression thereof and the methodology in arriving at it. Please, you can go to the next one. Plus, I will try and also discuss tariff for the gas services. The objective was mentioned earlier on, and I have also reiterated that a minute ago. But I want us to focus on what is natural gas. So from a commercial standpoint, when we are looking at natural gas, you are not looking at it in terms of its chemistry, in terms of its hydrocarbon formation, and whether uh, we have more C2s or more C3s or more C5. No, that will be chemistry. What we are looking at is looking at the product that we can get from the gas. So the gas in its natural state is supplied by tallow. When it gets to our facility, we process and get a lot more commodity. One of those gas is the lean gas. And in certain jurisdictions, lean gas is also termed as natural gas. So when it comes to natural gas, you'll be looking at the raw gas and the process or the lean gas. And then when it comes to the natural gas liquids, it could be so many, but within our context, you'll be limiting the discussion to condensate and LPG. 
So I've mentioned a bit about tariff and pricing, Try and I have tried to distinguish between it within our context. So we can move to the next one. Now, the market behavior, one may ask, why is the market behavior or the nature of market important? To arrive at the right price, you take into account the market behavior so that if you are in a competitive market, you price in a certain way. If you are in a monopolistic market, you price in a certain way. If you are an oligopolist, you also price in a certain way. So in a general economic theory, we have four markets, even though there are overlaps, but we have four distinct markets, monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistic competition, and perfect competition. These are the markets. I dare say that if you look at the global space, oil and gas tends to operate within the monopoly market and the oligopoly market. The reason is that in most places, and if you take Ghana as an example, we have a lot of monopoly or natural monopoly. But by the very nature of oil and gas assets, you would not want to have a situation where there's a pipeline moving from Atrabo all the way to Takrade, owned by Ghana Gas. And let's say he and I also decides to build a power pipeline when there's capacity on the Ghana gas one. So by the very nature of the infrastructure, utilities tend to tilt or behave towards the monopoly market. And even when the market is on bundle, we approach or the utilities approach the oligopoly market. It's also over the years been observed that when the markets or the field is new, green field, it tends to be heavily regulated. So in the case of Ghana, when the Jubilee discovery was made in 2007, the commercial operation starts in 2010, you notice that we had what you call foundation volume. And that foundation volume was as a result of negotiation between parties and government. If it was a developed market, I'm sure even the foundation volume would have been given a price. So when the market is starting in nascent developing markets, regression when it comes to pricing is very tight. But once the market begins to develop and mature, then we move more to a deregulated pricing mechanism. And you will see that in the case of lean gas or the gas market, we have a lot of regression when it comes to pricing. But when it comes to the NGOs, liquids, in part, uh, LPG and condensate in particular, you notice that there's some level of freedom when it comes to the pricing. So the global market generally tends to be one that sits with the liquid. So what happens in Amsterdam, its impact will mostly be fetched in Ghana. So there are instances that Ghanaians are complaining that prices are increasing. And the reason for that is basically because the global market or the global benchmark is increasing. But when it comes to the gas market, price and tariff are determined domestically because that market is not as global in nature compared to NGOs and the, and the liquid market. You may want to go to the next one, please. And all that I have said is that we need to understand the characteristics just so that we are able to price right. Now, if you look at this, you will notice that when the gas is processed at a trouble, it goes through a pipeline, that's the lean gas, goes through a pipeline to the demand centers. When it comes to the NGOs, Instead of using pipelines, in Ghana, we use BRVs, that's bulk road vehicles. And all these characteristics also speak to, or also are key variables in determining the price and tariff of the two or the three commodities. You can move to the next one, please, before my internet 
<laughs> Great. So again, having looked at the character and behavior of the market, and we've already established that the gas market tends to be monopolistic in nature and it, it all oligopolistic in nature. Now, given the nature of the market, one may ask, why is pricing important? Why is pricing important? And I made the point earlier on that if you want to have a robust safety regime for your operation, you will need money. And revenue is determined by two factors, the quantity and the price or tariff. Now, you will notice that the quantity is within the domain of a producer. So for instance, based on our plant capacity, Ghana Gas may decide to produce 135 million scarf of gas per day, or 150, as we are going, or 145, or 80. So these dynamics, when it comes to the production, you can decide what to do at a certain point in time. But when it comes to pricing, it's an exogenous factor. So if you look at the profit equation as we have it, we have B, X, and then total cost. So as we know, when you take revenue and then you deduct your total cost, you get your net profit. And the net profit, the bottom line, tells you how well you are doing. Now, in that linear equation we have there, price is the only exogenous, or strictly speaking, price is the only exogenous variable, or tariff becomes the only exogenous variable, in that tariff will either be determined by your regulator or price will be determined by the market. So given that, we need to pay particular attention if you want your investment to yield the needed viability or economic profit margins you are looking at. So that makes price important. And again, you know the investment within the oil and gas industry is massive and huge. And therefore, if you don't price right, knowing that the two variables that leads to revenue is your quantity produced and your price. Quantity produced is within your purview, so you can manipulate it and decide. I'm sure you've heard about the OPEC price and o OPEC plus and the issues Angola has with OPEC. OPEC noticed that prices were not at the levels that they expect. So what did they do? They said they are cutting because they know when it comes to production, it's within their purview. But when it comes to price, it's an exogenous variable. So you need to pay attention to it. We also need to pay attention to price because it's very volatile. And like you can see in the chart at our far left, you will notice that in fact, because it's been compressed, it does not show all the movement. But if it is expanded, you will notice that almost every day prices were moving. So you need to understand price, you need to understand tariff, so that at the end of the day, you are able to manage that volatility and optimize your margins. Economic theory also has that price and tariff influence the producer's behavior and the consumer behavior. So a consumer may decide that because they are, the prices are low, they want to buy more. And a producer will then decide, like OPEC has decided, that because the prices are low, they, they are cutting. So at the end of the day, these are key, the price is key determinant in the behavior of the producer or the consumer. So we need to pay attention to price. Kindly pay attention to the chart, the bar chart on our far right. You will notice that we have two columns in red. This was experienced during the COVID period where we registered negative price. So if you don't pay attention to pricing and if you don't manage your pricing well, in instances like this, your tanks will be getting filled up 
you need to release the product to the market so that it can empty your tank and take in more. But when prices are in negative, what do you do? And in this particular instance, prices were as low as $62 and $47. And when we have a negative price, it simply means that you need to pay the person for the person to take your commodity. So you need to understand and manage price in, in a way that it works. Same with tariff. Next, please. Now, you will notice that this chart, it appears that there is an upward movement. But when it, so usually this happens when it, you are dealing with tariff. Because it's being regretted, uh, sometimes the um, gazetted or approved tariff is able to have a resemblance of stability over a period. But when you are a producer, you are not just looking at it from that perspective. You are probably looking at it from the real value you are getting. And you notice that the growth rate is 0.16%. So assuming the nominal value is increasing based on the line we see, but the real value is decreasing, what that means is that you will have to take certain drastic measures, measures in order to keep your profit margins afloat. So this also underscore why pricing is very important in the discussion we are having. And I'm very much uh, thankful to the organizers for bringing on board pricing as one of the key issues or topics that needs to be discussed. Next, please. So I spoke earlier about consumer behavior and market demand centers. This is a, a very good example of it. So you notice that when it comes to liquid, and in this case, crude oil has been used as an example. Crude oil is predominantly used in transportation sector. Whereas gas is predominantly used in the power market. And you will notice across the world that when it comes to crude oil, because that market is global in nature, what happened at the global stage direct, directly affects what happens in the domestic market. And we have seen it in Ghana several times. But when it comes to power market, because it's local in nature, if you are putting up your tariff or if you are putting up your price, you have to pay attention to how the domestic economy is going to receive it. Because there can be instances where you, the producer, may decide that based on your internal economics and based on the global space, you want to price at a certain threshold. Or you even submit a proposal to the PURC and say that, I want you to approve X amount of tariff for me for the services I'm providing. But they, knowing that your product is predominantly used in the power market and the ripple effects of an increased fuel cost on the power markets, particularly the domestic power consumers, they may decide that, well, we are not even going to increase it. So in terms of even your forecasting, when you are forecasting your tariff or your price, all these dynamics must be at play so that you will end up pricing right in order to optimize your value. Next one, please. Great. So having underscored the importance of pricing in the gas market, we are now going to discuss NGL pricing regression and methodology. And like you know, regression provide a general framework in shaping decision of industry players. I've made this point earlier that matured markets tends to be what self regulated So the more a market become matured, the lesser it's regulated by a body. The more mature it becomes, the dynamics of demand and supply kind of take effect and the center hold. 
to moderate price movement, whether it's going to be high or low. Now, in Ghana, you used to have a system where MPA will decide how much should be sold, how much a product should be sold at the pump. So MPA will tell us every two weeks, MPA will publish, they will gazette a, a, a price that, okay, a liter of petrol should be sold at X and a liter of diesel should be sold at Y. LPG should be sold at this. Government is giving X amount of subsidy. So that was the nature of pricing or the character of pricing before 2015. What happened was that government came to the position that if they continue to regulate pricing, they will end up incurring more costs. And indeed, there were the subsidy component of the tariffs and prices they were putting across was becoming unbearable. So in 2015, government took a decision that no, market players should decide the price at which they will sell their products so that there are no subsidies to be borne by government. And all that the regulator, in this case, MPA does, is to be able to... Uh, all that the regulator does is to be able to monitor that nobody is taking advantage of the situation. That's all that MPA does. So they look at what you are selling. Is it above a certain threshold? Then they can rein you in. But as of today, prices of products are purely determined or mostly determined by um, the parties and not the regulators. Now, given that parties will have to decide, there must be benchmarks that they use in pricing. So before we move to the deregulated market, MPA was using Argos as a benchmark for pricing LPG. And they were also using flat gasoline as a benchmark for pricing gasoline. In our particular case, you say, condensate because condensate is a lower grade gasoline. Now, apart from Argos, ARA, light cargo, there are other benchmarks that you use. But what you do is that you have to do your internal analysis to see which one is suitability of the pricing benchmark in terms of its exposure to high volatility because certain prices benchmark are volatile compared to the other. But in Ghana, generally, we use the Argos, which is a pricing agency globally as the benchmark for pricing LPG. And you use PLAT for gasoline or petrol. Now, because we want to ensure that if you buy a product in Atrabo or in Accra, there's a uniformity in price government policy introduced what we call the UPPF. And the UPPF is basically you paying a token to ensure that there's uniformity in prices across all the regions, all the towns, and all the pumps in Ghana. So the UPPF, once you are buying a liter of petrol, you make a contribution to the UPPF fund, and that fund is able to moderate price movement so that there is no price disparity from Tema, which is the source in Ghana, or let's say a supply hub in Ghana, or a travel, which is a supply hub in the West. There will not be any disparity when you compare to those in Kumase. Next one, please. So I'm sure you've heard about the cylinder recirculation. Before that policy came into being, before that policy came into being, you used to have a very simple value chain where an exporter brings in products, it goes into the BDC's storage tanks, and then LPGMCs take the product. In the case of petrol, OMCs take the product, and then they sell to the station, and, we, and the consumer can go there to buy. With the cylinder recirculation, there will be a bit of change. And again, I'm bringing all these market dynamics to emphasize the point that 
pricing is not done in isolation. Pricing is done in, in a way that it reflects the market. So for me, anytime you are discussing pricing, the market behavior is key. And that's the reason why I keep going back to the nature of the market in order that we all understand that pricing is not done in isolation. Next one, please. So what kind of methods do you use in pricing? As you can see, LPG, there are several ways we can price LPG. You can look at the cost, what we call the cost base, where you just, in the case of Ghana Gas, you can decide that, okay, how much does it cost to produce a metric ton of LPG? And based on that, you will be able to put a certain margin on it and then sell to the domestic market. But that is not what we are doing. And the reason is that when you are a domestic producer, you do, not want, you do not want to go for a pricing mechanism that brings the uh, destruction in the market. So for instance, Ghana Gas and its partners supply close to 30 3% and in good season, close to 40% of the LPG used domestically. If you decide to use a cost base as a way of pricing, just looking at your domestic and your endogenous factors in arriving at your price, maybe you may end up pricing high, which will distract the market. Or you may end up pricing in a, a way that is going to create a gap in terms of supply. So Ghana Gas does not use a cost-based pricing. I mentioned earlier that we have Argos as a benchmark. Argos has several benchmarks. One of them is Argos Propane. So Propane, our engineering colleagues will tell you, is different from Butane. So Propane has a different properties. And because of its properties, its pricing is different from butane. So Argos also published Argos butane. Again, Ghana Gas doesn't use this pricing option because it's going to cause a market distraction. What we use is Argos butane, which is consistent with the domestic pricing philosophy. But you don't want to go in for a mechanism that is principally different and like I said, it will automatically destroy the market and that will affect supply into your domestic market, especially when you cannot supply all the 100% of the demand. You have to take a pricing mechanism that ensures import parity. Apart from using Argos, whether it is propane or butane, pricing can also be done using a net back. So a net back mechanism is simply saying that you are going to sit and wait for the end user to use your commodity as a fee stock. And then based on the margins they make at the end of the period and the cost incurred in arriving at the revenue, you will be paid. So for instance, if LPG is going to be used for bottling, Ghana Gas may decide, okay, we are not going to price the LPG. Let it be bottled. Then after it's been bottled, it's sent to the retail market and sold at a price of 100. Now, so that becomes the final revenue derived. Assuming the cost of bottling from the bottling plant to the LPG, through the LPG MCs to the market is 60 CDs then that 60 CDs will be deducted and you'll be left with, let's say, 40 CDs as the margin. And that margin, a percentage of it will go to the buyer and then a percentage of it will come to Ghana Gas as a producer. So it's also another way you can price using netback. But the deficiency in this pricing mechanism, which does not aid us in using it in pricing is that what happens if the, your off-taker comes and say, well, the cost 
that I told you is 60, uh, 60 cities. It's no more 60 cities, but it's 80 cities. What happens? Automatically, the margins that or the price you make for your product also deteriorate. So it's not an option that you use in our pricing. In order to develop a matured market, they also use option pricing. So options, those who did finance, it's a financial derivative, whether you are going to put in a put or you are going to be make a call. So it's a, comp a compressed derivative market. It's more like hedging, where you study the market trend and know when to st strike. But this pricing options is predominantly used in developed markets where they are financial instrument to underwrite a commercial transaction. So that's not an option that you use here. I mentioned that apart from LPG, in terms of NGLs, we also have condensates. Condensates in Ghana is used for two purposes. It's used for premiums, and it's also used for gasoline. Condensate is gasoline in disguise. So gasoline, the one you buy at the pump has a, a risk search of 10 number of, let's say, 91 minimum. Condensate also has an obtain number of 71 or 72. Now, because its characteristics is like gasoline, we either have to either have to upgrade it to gasoline or use it for premise, which is also a form of gasoline. So those are the two uses. Now, in terms of pricing, again, you can use a cost base, but we don't use that. You can also use indexation to NAFTA. So those who know the characteristics of condensate and NAFTA, they are very close. They have the same characteristics. I think the reason why one is called NAFTA and one is called condensate is the process of their derivation. So I'm told, I know that um, condensate will have to condense and in the process of that condensation, we are able to derive the product. So that also inform the name of the product. But in terms of it characteristics, it is purely NAFTA. So condensate is the gas equivalent of crude oil uh, refining. When you refine at the crude oil, you get NAFTA. But in terms of the characteristics, they are the same. Again, you can use options and net back pricing. Now, if you look at the bar chart with the balls, you will notice that we have a market-based price and a fixed price option. And we are doing a comparison. So here, what we intend to do is to know which one gives you more outing or which one gives you more price. Which one do you get more per metric ton of the product? So you notice the bar is constant. So when you're using a fixed price, so a fixed price can be derived based on your cost-based pricing. So based on your cost or based on negotiation, you may decide I'm going to sell the product at $200 to a buyer. The advantage of a face price is that you are not open to price volatility. So you will notice the price has been constant throughout the period. However, even though the market-based pricing has experienced some volatility, if you do the average over a period, you will notice that it gives you more. So what I'm saying is that even though market the market-based price is susceptible to price oscillation, if you do a long-term analysis or a long-term view of it, for liquid markets, it gives you more. For liquid markets, it gives you more. So then a decision will be made whether to use a fixed base or a market-based price. So to arrive at that decision, you have to undertake some of these analysis. Next one, please. Okay, so I mentioned earlier on that some time passed. MPA used to, MPA used to determine the price. And that's what we call the price buildup. So there's a, a typical example of a price buildup. You have your S ref. So when you're buying at the pump, so let's say after this session, you decide to go to the pump. The mechanism that leads to the price you pay at the pump is known as the price buildup. 
And then what goes into the price build up is the S ref. So the S ref is the price at let's say Ghana gas and Ghana gas price based on the S refinery price. So at the warehead at Ghana gas. And that is based, like I said earlier on, in the case of LPG, it's based on Argos butane. Once you have that, assuming you are bringing a product from Nigeria or Amsterdam, then you have to incur freight and insurance. So it becomes CFI, commodity insurance and freight. In our case, we do not incur that because the commodity is a domestic commodity. I must say you will definitely incur insurance for your own um, um, risk mitigation, but you do not incur freight because it's a domestic product. Then once you incur the CFI, the CIF, taxes and levies will be on top of it. Once you add the taxes and levy, you get what you call the S depot. The S depot is the price at which the BDC transfer the commodity to the OMC. And once you do the OMC, I mentioned UPPF, you notice that there's a margin here and it's 0 0.04. I'm sure it's been reviewed or it, sometimes from period to period it is reviewed. So if it is $1, then that $1 goes into the UPPF fund and it is used for the purpose as described earlier. Next, please. Okay, so we are moving from the NGL pricing. We've discussed several of eight methodologies that can be used to arrive at the final price. Now, having discussed the price board that which is the downstream price, what you pay at the pump, you are moving from the NGL pricing mechanism to the gas tariff mechanism. And again, being at the risk of sounding repetitive, but I'm stressing it for the its importance. Anytime you are discussing tariff or price, the market behavior or the market structure is key. And as a result, I have put here a layout of the existing infrastructure in Ghana in terms of gas infrastructure. You notice that the FPSO supply, particularly the FPSO at Amos and John Kufu, no, Atamos and Nkroma, surprise to the travel processing plant. FPSO John Kufu process the gas into lean gas and we meet them halfway at the ORS. Unlike the natural gas liquids, which is transported by the BRVs, in the case of this one, it goes through the pipelines to the end destination. Again, if you look at the chart, you'll notice that this has a resemblance of a monopoly. And a monopoly market also dictates what should be the pricing mechanism. Next one, please. Now, we've established that when it comes to the gas market, it has or it tilts towards a monopoly. So what do you do? The regulator take the center stage of determining the tariff, but they don't just do it on their own accord. The law requires them to put across general principles that guides their tariff determination. And some of these principles are economic efficiency that they need to give tariffs that ensures economic efficiency. So for instance, there can be instances where because the utility did not do the right thing, did not ensure efficiency, did not act as a prudent operator, the PURC, which is the regulator, economic regulator, may decide to penalize you. And there are instances that they may decide to give you a certain threshold tariff just so to ensure that efficiency. The tariff to be given must be fair and non-discriminatory so that assuming we have a class of consumers in let's say a particular market, one consumer must not pay less or more relative to the other. So there must be that fairness. And again, aside the consumer, 
the tariff must be fair in that the investor will, will be able to recover the investment they are putting in. So it's a double-edged saw. We need to ensure that the consumer interest is protected, the investor interest is protected. That is a KG one, but I believe the PRC does that to the best of their ability. Then it must be simple because at the end of the day, the more complicated it becomes, the less transparent it also becomes. So it must be simple and transparent. Cost recovery and reasonable profit margin. So you don't say that because you are a monopoly, you want to make abnormal profit, which is a typical characteristic of a, a monopoly market operator. They usually want to make abnormal profit, but because there's a regulator, they ensure that your cost is recovered and reasonable profit margins are made. There are several types of tariff that we can find across the industry. From the simple one where you are going to have a flat or you are going to have a very baseline price for every consumer, you pay this. So even I think UCG, UCG sometimes does that when they are unable to give you meter. They give you a certain agreed um, um, tariff that you pay for electricity consumption in your in your in your household. So we can have that simple one, or we can have the two part tariff, which is largely what the PURC uses, or we can have the three parts or the time of use tariff. So a time of use tariff will say that okay during the peaks period, you will pay relatively high because at that time there's high demand and off peak you pay relatively low. So these are all types and methodologies that you can use in arriving at a tariff to be paid by the consumer for the power or for the utility that is being consumed. Next one, please. So it continues to en enhance the financial sustainability of the utility. What do you do? I mentioned earlier that they need to be able to recover their investment and at the same time make a certain margin. As they do that, they must be able to provide safe and reliable services. And that brings into question the efficiency thing that I spoke about. Now, tariff usually occurs when there is a regulated market. So even in Ghana, we have the regulated power market and the deregulated power or non-regulated power market. So what happens is that in the regulated market, the regulator pay take the center stage in arriving at a tariff. In the non-regulated, it's sometimes bilateral negotiation between the utility and the consumer. So the two systems also exist in Ghana as well. Then the capital, you need to have a tariff system that ensures that every investment that is needed within the system, people or the investor will be ready to put their money in. So the tariff mechanism must not be punitive against the investor. Next one, please. Now, how do you then arrive at the tariff? How do you then arrive at the tariff? So uh, we have discussed the general principles that covers tariff derivation, but how do you arrive at the tariff? To do that, the first thing is to determine your annual revenue requirements. So the annual revenue requirement is basically how much, um, how much money or how much cash do you need in order to provide a prudent and, an, and effective services to your customers. So you have no revenue requirement. So you have to forecast and say, in 2024, we need about $20 million as the cash required for our investment and other operations and maintenance costs. And to arrive at that annual revenue requirement, 
you need to do a cost analysis. If you don't know your cost structure, you will not be able to arrive at the annual revenue requirement. So you need to do that as well. So after you have determined your annual revenue requirement, after you have determined your cost structure and you know exactly how much cost you are going to incur and how much margins you need to arrive at your annual revenue requirement, then you have to structure your, your, your tariff in a way that it suits the class of consumers you are looking at. So for instance, assume you are dealing with industrial customers and you have a tariff structure, you have to structure it to situate or to fit the industrial customers you are looking at. Same with, let's say, the power market. But again, remember, once you have done all this, the producer will not sit at his office or head office or the operational site and decide that, okay, I want to charge the end uh, the customer X amount. All these projections will have to be submitted to the PURC, the economic regulator, in accordance with their rate setting guideline, which you will see shortly. So once you do that, they will review the costs you've presented, the annual revenue requirement you require, and then decide to approve or ask you to make certain changes. Next one, please. So the point about the gas market being predominantly operated by monopolies has been well made, and I don't intend to go back to it. But because it's a monopoly, there are certain policies that guide the determination of tariff. So one such policy is the natural gas pricing policy 2012. So in 2012, government under the Ministry of Energy developed the pricing guideline for natural gas so that in terms of knowing the commodity price for the raw gas, there will be a certain framework. Then the PURC rate setting guideline also gives you the parameters for determining the tariff and the submission of the tariff is itself. The gas master plan is another set literature that you can refer to when it comes to tariff and how it should be structured. Next one, please. In all this, the principles we discussed earlier must be fundamental in arriving at the tariff. So if you check the 2012 gas pricing policy, you will notice that it encourages that all pricing mechanism or all tariff mechanism must ensure our resource is commercialized. So you don't, you, you don't intend that the gas we have will not be monetized. So the gas must be monetized, so the tariff must be right so that it can be monetized. It must ensure. So you will notice that all this fits into the general framework in terms of the guideline in arriving at tariff and to facilitate development of strategic sectors. So you notice prior to uh, Ghana gas commercial operation, there wasn't in heavy industrial, there wasn't an industrial use of gas, but because Ghana gas has a particular regime for industrial usage, you were able to bring on board new industry that use, uses gas for all in their operation. So the tariff also envisaged that you need to have that special dispensation so that you develop a certain economic growth pool within the Ghanaian economy. Next one, please. Customer, so here, financial viability was mentioned earlier on. The regulator will have to also manage the customer and the investor, uh, the investor interest. That's an interesting one. And maybe the next time we have a uh, somebody, or if there's anybody uh, on this call from PURC, you may want to tell us how you are able to manage the customer interest, which is 
contrary to the investor interest. So there are two opposing interests, but the laws and the guideline requires that they do that perfectly to ensure economic development and financial sustainability for players. Next one, please. All right. So having discussed the general principle, we want to be able to determine a tariff. Now, when you take every tariff, we have two components. We have what we call the commodity component and the service component. So the gas that is processed at Atuabo has a price. Under the foundation volume, it was a different regime, but the foundation volume has been completed or fully utilized. So now the gas that comes to a travel has a price and that price is known as the commodity price. Once you get a commodity price, which is mostly a pass-through. So when we say a pass-through, it means that the PURC hardly do something about it. Once the price is determined, it is added to the gas service tariff. Now the gas service tariff is what the PURC determines. So the PURC's role is to determine that based on the cost structure, based on the annual revenue requirement, based on the projected gas volumes that Ghana gas is expected to supply, what should be the tariff due them. So these are the key components of every tariff or the derivative tariff that you pick. There will be a commodity component and there will be a gas service component. Now, in Ghana, we have at least three different sources of gas supply. Ghana gas supply gas, ENI supply gas, and we also get gas from Nigeria under the YP. Now, you because of the principle of uniformity, you don't want a situation where the domestic gas is cheaper or much expensive compared to the imported gas, which I mentioned earlier will distract the market. Government introduced, working with PRC, I should say, introduced the weighted average cost of gas. And the weighted average cost of gas is to make sure that all streams of gas will go into a pool. And based on their volumes and individual tariff, they will then, PURC, I mean, will then decide what should be the universal or the weighted average cost of gas for power uses. You don't want a situation where ASO is buying at, let's say, nine, and VRA is buying at six. That will distract the market. So the weighted average mechanism is able to publish or provide a uniform price for all streams of gas. So there are instances where Ghana gas is higher. Ghana gas is mostly low, I should say. There are instances where the imported gas is higher. ENI is higher, but when you put it into the mix, it reduces the weighted or the final price for the consumer or the off taker. Now, whilst the commodity is straightforward, it's for the raw gas. The commodity price or the commodity tariff is for the raw gas. Its determination is based on negotiation between the ministry and other parties. Okay, of course, the buyer will be involved as well. But when it comes to the service, it's solely based on your cost structure and admission or approval by the PURC. The gas service tariff has three components. One is the gathering component, two is the processing component, and three is the transmission component. So when all these components are brought together, then we get what we call the gas services tariff. And when you add the commodity and the gas services tariff with all the levies and taxes, you get what we call the delivered gas tariff. Because PURC cannot just decide what they want to do, the law requires that every tariff that they approve must be gazetted, must be gazetted. And they are approving processes 
is very robust. Sometimes you submit data to them and they'll come back to validate or verify the data. If they have any misgivings, they raise it, then you have to go back to answer to the questions that they've raised. And then based on that process, they are able to give you a tariff based on the cost and the margin that will have to be given to make sure the company is a growing concern. Next one, please. Next one, please. Good. No, before this one. Good. Yes, that's fine. So, you know, I've been discussing principle. Principle, I've mentioned the annual revenue requirement. What is annual revenue requirement? So you notice that the annual revenue requirement first take into account what we call the regulatory asset base. So a regulatory asset base is the assets that has been admitted by the regulator. So what that means is that there can be instances where a certain asset will be sitting on your books, but the regulator has not admitted that as part of the regulated asset base. I also mentioned that we have the regulated market and the non-regulated market. Assuming you construct a pipeline from your fence to a non-regulated market operator, you don't expect that that asset will be part of the regulated asset base. So the regulated asset base should be one that has been admitted and is used for the purposes of the regulated market. Once that asset is determined, depreciation will have to be done and usually it's a straight line depreciation. You do your depreciation, you look at the return on assets, you look at your capital expenditure, sorry, your operational expenditure on that particular asset, the working capital allowance because you need cash flow to run your business, corporate income tax when it is applicable, and then your variable operation and maintenance costs. So when you add all these costs, then you get your annual revenue requirement. And that is the specific cash or amount required in order to operate as a prudent operator. So let's say when you do all this extrapolation, your annual revenue requirement is $200 million. Then what the PURC will do is that this $200 million, they will divide it by the total volume of product you expect to export within the same period. So let's say the total volume of exports is also $200 million. Then it means that when you divide, you have at least a dollar as your tariff. So Every tariff you pay in Ghana, all these processes that I have described is applied in order to tell Ghana Gas or in order to approve what is due Ghana Gas in the course of a, a period under consideration. Next one, please. So in the course of the internet fluctuation, I think in sending, there's another part that is missing where I had some numbers to it. So just to talk you through what I'm saying is that you have to get your regulated assets. If your regulated asset is less than $100 million, you have to depreciate it over a period. The depreciation can be over a five-year period or over a 10-year period, depending on what is allowable by the regulator. You go through that process and then you get your tariff. Once you have your tariff within that specific period, the company, so in this case, Ghana Gas, will be obligated to charge only that. So even when you have a misgiving, or even when you think that the tariff is not cost reflective, because the authority resides in the economic regulator, in this case, the PURC, Ghana Gas will have to still price just the $1, even if the economics shows that the $1 will not be sufficient. So in conclusion, pricing or tariff is key for growth and development as a growing concern. So if you want to be a company that continue to live and expand, 
then your pricing must be must be right. A wrong pricing will affect or upset your value proposition. And sometimes even though an operator or a utility has been given a, a very uneconomic tariff, that impact, the impact of that uneconomic tariff does not only affect the operator or the, that particular utility. So let's say if Ghana gas tariff is based on the economics, it's supposed to be two. And the PURC decides that you're giving you a tariff of one. Yes, Ghana gas revenue will suffer, but the impact does not affect Ghana gas alone because it's a chain. What happens upstream affects the midstream and the downstream. So wrong pricing regime obviously will affect your competitiveness. And gradually the market is moving to a regional level. There, there is still capacity on WAPI line. So assuming the domestic prices are high, some will decide that they want to bring in their gas from Nigeria. I want to thank you. And uh, once again, let me um, say very sorry for the initial distraction that we experienced. And let me thank the, the, the host for proposing an alternative way of handling this. I want to end here and take your questions. Thank you. So James, if there are any questions, I want to take the questions. Hello, James. I'm sorry, I was muted. I'm so sorry, I was muted. I was saying thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Kujo, for your insightful presentation. The very first one is saying, how do government policies impact pricing strategies for oil and gas? And then number two, what challenges arise for pricing amid supply, demand, and market fluctuations? Great. So um, to pick the government, the government bit policy determines how you should price. I mean, at the end of the day, especially when you are a state-owned company like Ghana Gas, you may have your internal mechanism, you may do your internal modeling and say that you want to price at X or 2X. Government policy probably put a limit on how much you can, you can price. And I give an example. You notice that the foundation volume from the upstream, the 200 BCF, even though the upstream parties could have priced at, let's say, a dollar per MMBTU, a dollar per even scarf, because policy of government at the time was that the 200 BCF for the foundation volume was supposed to be reserved for infrastructure development, they could not price. So obviously, when you are in the gas market, government policy obviously shape how much you can price. Another one could be, in, I, told, I told you earlier that condensate is used for premise. If you understand the nature of the premise market in Ghana, it goes to our fisher folks. If you are to price them based on the economic rates, maybe they will not be able to buy. And therefore, government policy will put a certain threshold on you that even though you can sell the product for let's say a thousand dollars per MT, because of the market in which you are going to operate, a thousand dollar per MT would not be able to support such a market and therefore give a discount of 50%. So that affects your revenue, but there's going to be an economic benefit or an economic development benefit. So at the very individual level, like a company like ours, you may say, okay, oh, I would have made 100,000 based on the volume. I'm only making a 50,000. But the economic impact is massive. The same can be said of the foundation volume. I'm sure if the upstream party sold it at a certain rate, they would have been able to make, rake in a certain revenue. But because government policy says that, no, 
we have to price that at zero, they comply. So obviously policy play a key role in as much markets also play a role. I showed earlier in the presentation where there was a negative 62 price. So assuming the average price over the time horizon was let's say 500. And within that, those two months, we are supposed to sell at negative 62. That obviously will affect your, your, your revenue outlook. So government policy has an impact. The dynamics of demand and supply also has an impact, impact on tariff and pricing. If you don't have any markets, you will not be able to, to even supply to start with. So those two variables are key determinants of pricing within our markets. Thank you. All right. The second question from Ebenezer is asking, how does government of Ghana subsidize uh, subsidies affect gas tariffs? And then the second one is asking, what's the future outlook of natural gas tariff and the influence of rapid investments compared to a well-established crude oil product pricing regime? Wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> obviously, obviously, obviously. So let me take the outlook. As the market develop, as the market develop, the utilities and other players within the market will have a lot more freedom to decide their tariff. And I give an example. If you take the telecom industry, government used to have a hand in it as well. If you take the insurance market in Ghana now, policy has an impact in it as well. But any time a market is developing, so in the case of the gas market, the outlook is that the market will expand. More players will come into the market. And as more players come into the market, the role of regression and government policy begins to reduce. They will become more like an overseer instead of becoming the 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 determinant themselves, it becomes like more of an overseer. So that's what happened when the market developed. I missed the first part of the question. So if you can take that one again, please. Okay, he's saying that how does government of Ghana have to this affect gas tariffs? Okay, so if governments give subsidies and they are unable to pay, obviously, it doesn't just affect the, the the tariff or the pricing alone. It affects your 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 sustainability. So players in the industry were happy when in 2015, government decided that the market should be one of a deregulated market when it comes to the liquids. When it comes to power markets, I believe that with time it will also be deregulated as well. And once it is deregulated, you will be, the impact of subsidy will definitely reduce. And I'm sure these days you don't hear BDC complaining that, oh, government has not paid us because of the subsidy. Once the market matures, that becomes the behavior of the market. And that is our expectation going forward. All right. Thank you very much. Audience participant, please. Put your questions in the Q and A, and Mr. Mr. Sylvester Kujo will do justice to it for you. Whilst we wait for more questions, I must say that we could have decided to have a much more rigorous mathematics to go through. How do you determine your beta? How do you determine your weighted average cost of capital? Where how do you determine your risk free rates? How do you determine? So, in the actual sense of work, when we are working on all these things, these matrices are derived. So, you derive your asset base, you derive your depreciation by looking at your straight line or whether you are supposed to use reducing balance. You have to also look at even which benchmark is more. Volatile. So there are instances where certain benchmark can even give you a higher price of, let's say, thousand metric tons per per bar uh, per metric uh, thousand per metric tons. But because it's very volatile, because it changes almost every day, 
you may decide to go for the one that is much more smoother. So these are some of the things that goes into it. This presentation aims to provide a general overview and the principles underpinning the pricing mechanism. I believe in subsequent editions, if there are opportunity, we can look at just taking the team through the step-by-step -step derivation based on the principles we've discussed today. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I guess this is definitely not the last time we'll be engaging you. Uh, from day one, day two, day three, we, we went through the overview of the gas sector, gas demand and supply balance, the gas processing plant itself, health, safety, and environment, and then the last but not the least, the gas tariffs and NGL pricing. On behalf of the section officers of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, I'd like to thank you all very much. Our 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 speakers, our distinguished guests, we thank you all very much. Our at this juncture call our session director, Madam Celestina Kisi, to give us the closing remarks. Madam Celestina, over to you. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, James. Thank you, James. It's been a very wonderful um, four days and a power-packed action event. I mean, just as you related, we've had various um, topics for discussion for the past four days. And each of our presenters are well-versed with um, what we want to learn to the students. I've seen a few posts from some of you appreciating this initiative by Society of Petroleum Engineers Ghana. Um, we appreciate the fact that some of your colleagues could not join. So we have the recordings on our YouTube channel. So for those who are unable to get internship opportunities, the aim is that this um, initiative will allow you to write your report to present to your various universities. So if you aren't able to take part um, live, you can also just go to our YouTube handle to have access to the recordings for the past four days. So with that being said, I'll say thank you to Ghana Gas, all our presenters. We appreciate the fact that the CEO, Dr. Ben Atente, allowed everyone to um provide this information, which is very, very important. In fact, the attendance has ranged from about 120 on the first day to about 22 at the moment. And this is very good and it would be good if you're able to replicate it in, in our other um, organizations. Thank you everyone for joining. Watch out on our SP social media handles for upcoming programs because next week as well, we have a career guidance program, which will be an action packed program running for about four days. If you watch out on our social media handle, you'll see it and plan to join in to learn a thing or two. Thank you once again and goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, our session, one of our session directors. Madam Celestina Kishi for giving us the closing remarks. I reiterate our thanks to Dr. Revision of Home, Mr. P Peter and Mr. Hagan, Mr. Albert Mesatando, Engineer Michael Kwabnam, Mr. Yasu Yahaya, and then Mr. Sylvester Enumikujo for your invaluable insights shared to us over the four day period. We say we are very much grateful and God bless us all. Thank you very much and then see you at our next event. Cheers and goodbye.